Greetings! Oh, what is up and everyone? Welcome to the channel. The sun is hiding and the magpie is casting. Coming to you all this fine Monday uh, with some more Company of Heroes 2 live game casting. And then uh, after we've had our fill of Company of Heroes 2, we're going to move in and cast some Deserts of Karak later on in the stream. So do stay tuned if you're a fan of the homeworld action that's going to be coming at you. What's up, Datton? Good to see you in chat, my friend. Thank you very much for showing up. You are bang on time, right as the stream opens. Um, let's have a look at the schedule for this week. Okay, so we're, we're casting today. Um, I appreciate I'm an hour late, uh, for which I do apologize. Um, I had something come up. I had, a, I had a call which I had to take and that has only just finished. But um, yeah, we're streaming today at midday, one hour late. Uh, and then we'll be doing uh, evening casting on Wednesday and Friday. So uh, definitely tune in if you can catch the show um, on twitch.tv slash magpie842. If you can't, you can find the VODs at youtube.com slash magpie842. Now, <clears throat> I think that that brings us up to, uh, up to, um, up to the cast, up to the up to the games for today. Um, is there really anything else? No, I think that's it. Now, hopefully, I've got a banger for everyone. Um, going to be the first game of the day. Two terrific players. So let's uh, let's jump on into Company of Heroes Two. Spawning in the north, playing as the Vermac pieces. It is going to be Tiramashit, who is Panzer Grenadier and Grafen. They're going to be running with an, uh, a defensive doctrine Ostrapen build here on Lost Glider. Spawning in the south, playing. As the United Kingdom forces, it is going to be the Royal uh, Engineer. No, the Royal. Yeah, the Royal Engineer Regiment. Yep, I got it. Of Caesar. Um, so uh, yeah, um, Caesar. Of course, we've caught a few games on the channel recently, and uh, he's just got a really quite unique, quite idiosyncratic style of playing UKF. But it's it's a really neat style. Uh, it kind of plays them in a very calm fashion. Very rarely seems, if ever, seems to reach for the AEC or the Bren carrier. Um, and, whoa. Oh, this is in two times speed. <laughs> Let's just get that going back. Um, yeah, very rarely reaches for those um, for those units. Tends to play a, just a sort of a core UKF style, relying on Tommy's supported by strong weapon teams to be... Uh, to be to be to be to, to deliver the goods kind of it, it, it reminds me of a vermac style if vermac wasn't always using ostrapen <laughs> but it does remind me of a vermac style because you're just kind of using tommies instead of grenadiers and you're using vickers instead of mg42 and um just trying to play a core style a solid sort of style based on the synergies between those those units so uh i really like caesar games and uh, it seems that caesar is also capable of winning at the top um, at the top end of the ladder as well so Looking forward to seeing um, exactly what he's going to be doing as this game goes on. Uh, seemingly, although it is early days, this is a typical Caesar like style. Tommy's and Vicar. Um, I appreciate the game's only two and a half minutes old, though, so hardly, hardly conclusive proof that Caesar will be playing that kind of a style. Conics with the. Every Brit player doesn't deserve respect. Who hurt you on the ladder, my friend? Who hurt you? <laughs> Damn. I actually think Brit player, UKF players deserve quite a bit of respect. The faction is... The faction has some pretty rough spots. Let's put it that way. So, what else have I been doing over this last week? It has been a busy one. Um, yeah, um been playing a lot of Command and Conquer 3 Kane's Wrath which is still half price in the sale if you uh, if you want to get that one on Steam you can pick up Kane's Wrath at the moment and it is such a good RTS um, you can get it working with CNC online and uh, I've been having just a whale of a time with that one man oh my god the factions are so well designed in that RTS and I, I even actually quickly um, had a quick google around and there is a thriving competitive scene like there are tournaments that have been going on over the last few months that have like 22k viewers and stuff. So I was like, what? Okay, CNC3 is kind of alive. And I watched a few games and yeah, it's really exciting. It's like actually just an insanely good RTS, it seems. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty pretty hyped about that one, to be honest. Uh, I may see about casting a couple of games of that because the, the games just look so sick like i just watch them and i'm just like no i want to cast this like it's just so cool the things that the players are doing and the way the games go i yeah so anyway you could do a lot worse than picking up command and conquer 3 kane's wrath um yeah conics there, there are a lot of uh 
There are a lot of uh, better RTSs than Company of Heroes 2. You're absolutely right. But Company of Heroes 2 does a lot of things that only Company of Heroes 2 does. And it's very dear to uh, many people, myself included. And uh, for this reason, essentially, and because it's probably the RTS that I may know the best, it's, it's either Company of Heroes or StarCraft 2 or, nowadays, Kane's Wrath. Those are the three RTSs that I know really, really, really well. Deserts of Karak even, you know, because I'm not playing it or casting it as much, I'm kind of probably, and because the, you know, A-game has been balancing it a lot, I'm probably slightly more out of touch with that one, but I do love it, and lucky for me, I get to cast it. So, uh, yeah, um, right, early stages of this game, we've got Triple Ostropon, MG42, Pioneers, uh, Panzer Grenadiers coming in, and it does look like Caesar is kind of going to try and play the sort of default Caesar style here. Gonna secure double fuel as well, which is really nice. So UK forces getting off to a reasonable start in this game. It's tough to take fights out on the map at the moment. Ostropin are quite good, especially against Tommies. And uh, the support with the MG42, the Flamethrower, and the Panzer Grenadiers means that the German player actually just has more muscle here. The army is just stronger in a straight up fight, so Caesar is gonna have to do what Caesar can to get Caesar's work done. Something funny about talking about Caesar in the third person like that, always, always really amusing. Um, so there was a UKF sniper on the on the, on the the roster there for a moment, but Caesar gonna cancel out of that. And that's another sort of Caesar uh, specialty. The, the UKF sniper is a real Caesar thing. Uh, so I'm kind of sad to see him cancel that. Probably we're still gonna have the sniper after the Royal Engineers, because I don't think I've seen a, a UKF Caesar game for a long time where Caesar didn't build a UKF sniper, and to be fair, well, that sniper didn't go on to do really well. So, kind of hoping that we do see the sniper creep back onto the queue. The manpower is banking up right now, so it could well be that that's the intention here. <laughs> uh. So, uh... Flamethrower finishes on the uh, on the Royal Engineers. A second squad of Royal Engineers. Okay, perhaps this is an adaptation to the Royal Engineer Regiment. We're going to lean into Royal Engineers a little bit harder. I got no problem with that. The UKF Sniper is absolutely fine, but I think snipers in general are in a kind of poor spot in Company of Heroes. So, uh, and especially against Ostropon. Like, Ostropon per skull are actually quite low value, so busting those skulls not especially efficient. Nothing about this scenario screams let's build UKF Sniper to me. Uh, only the fact that it's Caesar and Caesar is actually pretty decent with like microing and building UKF Snipers, so we'll have to see. Obviously the Sniper is a fun unit to watch, but I don't think it's especially well positioned in the meta. Bundle Grenade here, gonna connect onto a Vickers gun. Nice to get some damage out of that. And PGA just continuing to take pretty smart fights all over the map. The point is being Finally getting German boots onto the fuel points here and there. The fuel, the fuel income disparity has, has been huge, to be honest. Caesar has been raking it in. Although the scoreline looks pretty bad. Like, this is not indicative of a scoreline that's been, you know, favoring the UKF in the early stages here. But the fuel control has been really decent. And to be honest, you would probably trade a 50 ticket deficit to have, like, fuel fuel advantage for the first 10 minutes so that's pretty cool not sure that pga has lost this game yet connex we'll see a bit early for that seems pretty healthy to me gonna finally be securing a fuel here getting control over this cutoff again double panzer grenadier gonna be supplementing the triple ostropon as we're used to seeing from vermac forces enemy causing trouble trying to take one of our points Let's just quickly check the tech here for these two players. So, Platoon Command Post has finished. And we actually have the money for Company Command Post. That is how much fuel Caesar has been getting. Uh, for PGA, it looks like no sign of Battle Phase 2 yet. And it's just like the mechanized company. So, this is kind of the the standard version of the, uh, of the Ostropin build that we're used to seeing uh, Ostia players go for these days. And I love getting the pack gun just now. 
This is the old safety pack gun. Less needed against UKF than like anybody else, but sometimes you need to get it to not die, so <laughs> PGA gonna be doing that. I'm, I'm kind of excited to see if it's going to be Stug Ease here from PGA, because PGA has been such a chronic user of Stug Ease over the years. And I love a good Stug E. They're just so satisfying to watch in action. A very explosive unit. Boys from Wales here, putting on a fiery display. And it looks like PGA's uh, eastern flank is going to crumple here. Oh, oh, we need to fall back on these engineers. There we go, nicely done. Pack gun uh, is actually going to reveal itself. A touch awkward there. Our opponents are seizing a sector. That's just kind of some free information there for Caesar. Not the end of the world. You would probably assume that the Vermac player has a pack gun by now, but it's nice to know for sure. Neglecting the pyro. Oh, yeah. Good point. I'll be honest, even with the changes to the pyrotechnics package, I'm not in love with it still. It's, it's definitely good. It's a powerful thing to have. All right. And, you know, I must concede that. I, I would still just rather have access to a regular mortar squad, though. That's, maybe I'm old-fashioned. Maybe that's just... Maybe I need to learn how to play outside my comfort zone. But, like, just a mortar squad will always feel more solid to me and get the job done more effectively than the pyrotechnics package. And um, Caesar has been putting on fantastic pressure. Falling a little bit far behind in the scoreline now. This is a lot of tickets to have given up in the first 11 minutes for a game that you've kind of been winning. Like, I don't know about been winning winning, but definitely looking okay on. Ooh, Panzer Grenadiers here getting super low. Sten guns blazing, but it won't be enough here for the Royal Engineers. And the German squad will escape for now. PGA not being too unlucky there with the, uh, with the uh, RNG on his falling back Panzer Grenadiers. And let's see now, I believe, yep, company command post is done, and Caesar's going to have Cromwell cash in a second here. So if that's the intention, we'll see. Whoa, look at how much manpower Caesar is uh, banking here. Jesus. That is quite a lot, to be honest. Wow. What's up with that? Okay, it's going to be a Cromwell. Connex, what happened to you, bro? Sounds like you need some therapy, man. It sounds like there's something in your past that you need to work through there, that something's happened to you to do with UKF forces. <laughs> They're not that bad, I, I promise you. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's going to be a Cromwell coming out here. So let's just quickly check the tech. No sign of Battle Phase 2, even. So PGA keeping all the options open for now. Going to be leaving themselves the room to go... <laughs> For, uh, oh, hey, what have we got here? Mish Q18 is now following. Oh, thank you very much. Very glad that you're enjoying the stream there. Wow. Really appreciate the support. Panzer Grenadiers here. We'll pick up a Vickers. Oh, that could be a nice bit of hardware here for the Axis player to get hold of. You would love to have a second MG under these circumstances. Tommy's as well getting a little bit encircled. They'll have to get out of there. And uh, some incentive now for Caesar to try and hold this position. Obviously doesn't want to give up this machine gun. Goes for the grab. But Panzer Grenadiers are here. That's a lot of STGs blazing. So this might actually just be an offering of three infantry models here. And it will be with the bundle grenade to complete that kill. Uh, PGA recognizing the value and investing in retrieving this Vickers machine gun. And that's a nice thing to grab. The Cromwell tank's going to be coming into the hood here. But I don't think it's actually going to be in time to prevent this hardware from getting out in German hands. Indeed not. And uh, wow, a big fallback here going to come down. Where is the pack gun? It is in position here. Going to start taking some shots. Donk. Okay, he's, hopefully Caesar saw that one and is going to back up here. There we go. But the loss of that Vickers gun, essentially first blood in this game. And that is a shame. Triple cap, though, established for the UKF player. So doing something to redress that scoreline imbalance. With the Cromwell on the field, of course. Uh, I mean, this, this unit is definitely the kingmaker. Royal Engineers are actually going to fluster the pack gun. That's a little bit annoying here for the Axis player. And... That's going to enable the uh, the Cromwell just to push it all the way back into the base, routing almost every Axis force on the map. Only these Ostrapen remain active on the map, and they are finding value. Grabbing a fuel point is really nice. But uh, this Cromwell has basically routed the entire Axis army, so that's a problem. 
<laughs> Drunk Dwarf 98 What's going on, friend? Good to see you in chat. I don't think I've seen your username in chat before. And yes, yes, Connix does have some serious salt. Um, I've come to the conclusion that something must have happened to Connix in the past. He's been abused by a UKF player somehow. <laughs> and uh, probably needs therapy for that. Um, okay. So the tank commander is done on the Cromwell. Pretty standard stuff. Going to be uh, going into a QF six pounder and another Vickers gun and a medic squad. Okay, interesting stuff. Cool, glad to see. Panzer Grenadiers will, will reach for the Shreks here. So some additional AT resources getting mixed in. PGA recognizing that a single pack gun on a map the size of Lost Glider never really going to be adequate against the Cromwell. And so those Panzer Shreks will be helpful. A useful tool to have when your opponent has this Cromwell. Tommy's getting pinned in the north. Angry squads of Panzer Grenadiers going to run through. He's going to get some Shrek rounds into the Cromwell here. Nice hits. That's some good damage there. The pack gun at the moment covering the center VP, so isn't going to be able to chip in right now. And the Cromwell just going to fall back a little bit here. Royal Engineers in tow. We'll be able to fix that one up pretty quickly. Medic squad indeed, Datton. Yes. Yes, yes. The lesser spotted medic squad is going to be here. And that seems like a pretty cool thing to have. How much is the medic squad? We never see it. 180 manpower. There you go. Interesting. And how much unit cap? Just three. Interesting. That's such a weird... Enemy threatening a capture hmm. point. Have UKF players, like, properly experimented with building two of these and having them follow up your Tommies and just, like, do the capturing whilst your Tommies cat or whilst your Tommies fight and then your Tommies can just, like, kite back to them for heals? Is that effective? Probably not because you're not getting the reinforces, but... Still, Bundle Grenade coming onto another Vickers gun here. Actually not getting the damage that it looked like it might, so the British MG will escape for now. But a nice attempt there from PGA, and we're coming into the phase of the game now where PGA is going to have a bit of freedom to spend some of this fuel, going straight up to Battle Phase 3. I'm interested. This is kind of... I appreciate that this has been a low fuel game for PGA, so this looks kind of late and, and not that great, but I wish that Vermac players took this teching route more option. Skip Infantry Company, skip Support Armor Corps, lean on Ostrapen with the standard Ostrapen MG Panzer Grenadier build, Lean on, le use your life the mechanized company if needed for pack guns. Well, well I mean, they're going to be needed, so <laughs> use your life the mechanized company for pack guns. And then go for battle phase three and just see what happens. Like, this is going to be an, a, like a what, 17 minute heavy panzer core? Yeah, essentially. So from now on, that is the 25% manpower saving on reinforce. And obviously, that's going to be worth more the earlier you get it. And this is relatively early, so I like getting it early. That There are, there are efficiency gains to be made there. And uh, now we have access to the Brumbar. And that's going to be... That's going to be pretty spicy here. You have to think, oh, I don't know, actually. You know, it could actually be a Panther. Panther would also look totally fine here. Because uh, we've got double Cromwell now. And obviously a Panther would thrive in that kind of target-rich environment, uh, whilst also being quite slippery and difficult to kill. So how much is the Ostia Panther? I always forget. 185 fuel. Jesus, that's more than I remember. <laughs> how much is an OKW Panther, then? Is an OKW Panther the exact same? Am I right on that? Wow, that seems like that seems like some pretty expensive Panther right there. Jeez, 185 fuel. I actually had no idea they cost that much. That is sort of, sort of mad. Okay. Well, wow, Cromwell is actually going to be able to dive all the way in here. Pack gun will repel it for now, and there's another pack gun on the queue here for PGA, so that's pretty good. This has to be for, this has to be a Panther game. That's the only reason I can think of for saving this hard. So, okay, I, 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 I guess it should be a Panther and then follow up with a Brumbar? I think that that makes sense on this map. We'll have to see how things play out, but the Panther looks super appealing right now. Well, Connex, I mean, the Panther is a heavy tank, sure. Um, if you, it, I mean, it's up to you how you want to classify it, but it's a very good unit. 185 fuel. I'm not saying it's too much. It's just all the way back in my day, it always used to be 175 for, like, the longest time. So that's the number that's etched into my mind. But, I mean, if the community balance team wants to put it at 185, knowing how good Panthers are, I am totally prepared to accept that that's the correct cost. And, okay... 
Axis forces pushing hard over in the east over here, but... Wow, actually, why is this Vickers gun displacing? Oh, because the uh, flamethrower was advancing. Okay. And this Vickers gun is just going to be so annoying. Ostropin do not have rifle grenades, so this Vickers gun is probably just going to hold this fight. There are a lot of Lee Enfields as well, casting bullets in from the flanks here. Whoa, going to pick up a Vickers gun over here in the west, though. Okay, nicely done, PGA. And it is going to be a panther. So here we go. Well, I think the Panther's going to be the right choice here, and that's going to change the dynamic considerably. Um, these Cromwells are going to have quite a task ahead of them. Let me just check. No sign of Hammertech yet. Hammertech. Um, so once the Panther comes out, I kind of feel like PGA will have the upper hand. Triple cap established right now for the UKF player. Going to be establishing double fuel. So this Panther has some work to do. But... If the Panther can shift the armor battle, I feel like this German infantry roster is poised to explode out and just deal with this UKF roster. Three squads of Tommies and one Vickers gun with a couple of Royal Engineer squads thrown in does not beat three squads of Ostropin, two squads of Panzer Grenadiers with three MGs. Just doesn't beat it. Like, it shouldn't. So, obviously it comes down to how the fights go down and exactly where the arcs on the various guns are. Uh, and, and, and how the players, like, make the decisions leading into it. But I think on paper, this German army... Now that the Panther is here, is a little better. So we will see. PGA needs to get out from under the clock. The Panther immediately reveals itself. Going to overrun onto some infantry out in east here. Going to drive them away. And now it's going to be... Now it's going to be on Caesar. What's your adaptation now, Caesar? 900 manpower. Jeez. What a manpower float. It's kind of insane. Hopefully Caesar springs for another AT gun when he sees the Panther. Yeah, I agree, Dan. I think that would be wise. Oh, Vickers gun. Arrgh! Gets gibbed here. That is that is both. That is, in fact, all of the Vickers guns now have been hemorrhaged. And it seems that PDA doesn't even want this extra Vickers gun. That is one too many. Four probably is too many machine guns. So he's just going to take it out with the Panzer Shreks here. Interesting stuff. Okay. Now with no machine guns as well, uh, getting a bit worried for Caesar. Now Caesar does have enough manpower, we can buy the machine guns. We can afford as many AT guns as we want. I think two AT guns is probably fine uh, with the two Cromwells. And you can just see the Axis army pushing forward, grabbing ground. Generating value. The enemy is determined, and we are down to 300 points. Point and the scoreline... Getting close to being even again. Alright, Caesar. Let's see what you got, man. Here comes the Panther from the flank. The, the QF6 Pounder and both Cromwells have it acquired, so that's nice. And it's not going to get any work down here. It's going to be a Firefly. Wow. I like the Firefly. The Firefly seems cool, because it's got two Cromwells to hide behind, and it just answers anything armoured. So this this shuts down the Panther immediately, and it also makes a Brumbar look seriously dubious. And I think a Brumbar, if you don't have a Firefly, would be really good here, because it just, it just drops the hammer on this UKF infantry, which is already depleted with the loss of the MGs. And if these Tommies are unable to fight because they're exploding, and if they do start getting squad wiped, I think that's a rapid route to victory for the Vermac player. Obviously, and I often say it on the channel, if you wipe out your opponent's core infantry, you're gonna have a good time. So, I actually think I quite like I quite like the Firefly because you know you you know your opponent has Battle Phase Three and a heavy Panzer Corps, and a Brumbar looks bad right now. So the Firefly is sort of a nudge to your opponent, to say, "Hey, don't get a Brumbar, buddy." And I think that's actually a healthy thing for Caesar. So, uh, all right, here comes the Firefly. Tulips and Tank Commander immediately purchased, and there's a decent bank for using those Tulips as well. So, okay, let's see what the Firefly can get done in a modern game of uh, Vermac versus UKF here. Whoosh! This piece of debris here is getting punted. Pack guns immediately acquire this Cromwell, and the Panther comes forward. Ugh, oh, unfortunately rolling a miss there. And um, where's the Firefly? Oh, okay, it's all the way out over here. It's not actually in position to exploit. Oh my god! 
Oh, this is an overextension. PGA, what are we doing? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What the? This is so unnecessary. Okay, the Tulip's actually not doing very well at all. And he gets a Cromwell and manages to escape with the Panther. <sighs> that was quite an overextension, if you ask me. I think he got a bit lucky to get out with the Panther there. Man. Panthers are a long-term investment. Any, if, if a Panther survives for a long time, it normally does really well. And because of that, I don't think it's very suited to taking a dive. Now, I, I appreciate P P PGA there with the killer instinct to come in. He does pick up a tank, so it does look okay, but that was quite a risk. Uh, you don't like the Firefly either, Datton. Okay, fair enough. Well, maybe it ain't that good. I guess... I, but the thing is, you don't want your opponent to go for Brumbar, right? And the, the Firefly helps you with the Panther whilst also sort of strongly disincentivizing your, your Axis opponent to go for the Brumbar. Like... Yeah, okay, yeah, fair point, Connex. Uh, I think, yeah, the, the comic would probably have been better, yeah. And now, Caesar is in a really unenviable position. PGA has the triple cap, and this German infantry roster, there's just nothing really to help here, and for sure the comet would have been better uh, against this infantry. And, I mean, how do you break this lock now? Ostropon and Panzergrenadiers with, with triple MG dug in nicely, pack guns spaced out along the line, and it's going to be a Panzerwerfer. PGA, I love it. This Panzerwerfer is going to be the checkmate piece of the composition, if you ask me, because how do you possibly break out of this when your opponent, ha you, have, you have to break out through a Panzerwerfer as well. That's so nasty. So I love it from PGA. This Panzerwerfer is actually way better. And of course, the Firefly is kind of rubbish against the Panzerwerfer because it should never be taking shots into the Panzerwerfer. So that's just probably not going to happen. Sniper did see it on the queue just now, and it is going to complete. That's very weird, but okay, if that's what you want to build. Firefly doing its best against the Panther, but it's not going to come anywhere close to getting a kill. And look how many machine guns. There's, there's going to be a machine gun anywhere you decide to push. So Caesar kind of needs some indirect fire. I think now would be an acceptable time to go for some pyrotechnics packages, but there's no room for it on these Tommies. Bren guns are popping up on them, but I mean, Bren guns aren't much use when you're this heavily suppressed. And there's, uh, I mean, wow, actually, okay, some, some Royal Engineers actually grabbing Eastern VP is huge. That's going to help stabilize the bleed rate at 115, and stabilizing the bleed rate is what we need for Caesar here, but I'm not convinced it's going to be enough. Machine gun blazing still from this building. The sniper is going to help counter the machine gun teams, I give you that. Not if he's getting set on fire, though, damn. Um, and Caesar's forces are beaten back once again, and he may only realistically get, like, one more try here. Um, hey, Strumming Bird, what's going on? The Panther could instantly die, and the UKF army would still lose to the German. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, this is such a terrible position. Here comes the Panzerwerfer Barrage. Not actually going to find any value here, but whatever. It's cool. We got more of those in 100 seconds. Um, <clears throat> assuming this game goes on that long. Uh, so, yeah, this looks, this looks pretty rough. It is difficult to see a way out of this for Caesar. The triple MG and just this relentless... Oh, he actually did kill an Ostrogon squad somewhere. I missed that. Well, that's a help. But the thing is, you can rebuy those for 200 manpower. So, like... <clears throat> you know? And... Here's another thing, actually. I suppose the flamethrowers on the Royal Engineers have been good. But how good has this commander actually been this game? Not that great, really. So um, when you compare the amount of value that this defensive doctrine commander has given the Vermac player, it's like, it's not even close, is it? Um, and the triple cap is going to be re-established here. And that is probably game. Difficult to see a clear route for Caesar here to stay in this game. Some Tommies will grab West, and that's going to help a lot, but... <clears throat> The situation looks super bleak. How do you ever hold two of the victory points on this map? That's the question now. Well, he's going to have a try now. Cromwell coming out, going to challenge into mid here. The Panther is actually not repaired, but the Panzerwerfer will have a barrage ready, so listen for that to come in here to blunt this UKF assault. As the Cromwell is going to push a little further forward.
This is looking pretty grim here. He is gonna get he is gonna get the decap on mid though. So that'll get him off the clock, and that was kind of the mission objective here. So that's okay. The Panther comes forward, but into a lot of AT resources. Double QF6 pounder and a firefly. Donk da donk 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 tulips. And he gets the Panther. That was the one place that Panther did not want to extend into. And so that's a nice pickup. Uh, gonna lose one of his six pounders, but you know what? He doesn't need them anymore. The German player doesn't have any tanks, so that's okay. Um, British forces still controlling two of the victory points. I mean, this is what a comeback starts to look like here for the UKF player. Sniper still thundering away. The Firefly forced to scurry away. But these Bren Gun Tommies are actually getting close and personal onto some of the softer units in the Vermac lineup here. Can Caesar take this? He's going to build another Cromwell, and that's probably the right choice. PGA floating a stack of fuel here. Could go for another Panther once their manpower is there. What is it? 490 manpower. Yikes. I can't believe the 30-minute sniper is working. <laughs> it, it is sort of pushing the machine gun teams back. I mean, that's clearly why it was bought, right? Um, and this is kind of a way of getting the, the coordinated fire as well. I mean, it's not as good as the smoke, but it gives you half of the pyrotechnics package, kind of. Um... But it, it is pushing back the it is pushing back the, uh, the machine guns, which is kind of the reason it was bought. So yeah, it's actually nice to see. Caesar, to be honest though, is probably one of the best UKF sniper players that I've ever seen. Just seems to be very consistent at finding value with those units. Or oh, the machine guns are going to get set up here. That sniper has to make himself scarce, and he will. Boys from Wales going to push up. There was a Vickers gun here first, so that's going to start picking down these machine guns. Sniper coming around the wall, looking for another shot here. Cromwell comes in for support. Up to yeah, the double Cromwell is done. That's the Panzerwerfer you here now. So probably coming down on this machine gun, just behind it actually. Not actually really finding anything. Jeez, that 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 has been super unlucky. Another Panther on the queue here, but 56 tickets and remaining stable. UKF forces slowly creeping towards the victory point, but no, a machine gun bunker well placed by PGA gonna push them away. One of the Cromwells is hemorrhaged here, just just pushes out a little too far, and the two pack guns will eat that one up. But UKF forces take back mid. And this is what this is what Caesar is here for. So okay. The game continues, but here comes that next panther. And now there's only one six pounder as well. Caesar was not able to rebuy the, the other six pounder. UKF forces digging in heavily here. Need to hold this victory point. And it looks like PGA is gonna pivot and attack west. There's only one squad of Tommies here and the flamethrower will probably deal with them. And, uh-oh, this looks pretty bad. Now, there's no real AT here except for the Faust. So this Cromwell is actually a decent response. Going to get double Fausted, though. That means that it could be an easy snack for a Prowling Panther. The Panther is actually coming. It's about to enter this battle from the from, from the side of the screen here. Here it comes. Uh-oh, is this a dead Cromwell? Where's the Firefly? Did he bring it over? Oh, no, the Firefly is actually getting hung out to dry. Shrek's striking home on that one. Keep an eye on its health in the top right. But I'm going to frame the tank battle for now, as this Cromwell will surely be destroyed. And with it, perhaps, Caesar's hopes in this game. There goes the Cromwell. And it looks like a Shrek from these uh, Panzer Grenadiers is the... Ah, oh, no, he parks the Firefly here. Oh, that's game. I mean, probably. That is a lot of value to lose. I'm not quite sure how you hold on now as Caesar. The Panther will be utterly resplendent here. There is nothing to deal with it. He could just start buying Panzer Fours now if he even had a support armor core, but he doesn't. But, I mean, a Brumbar would be fine here. Just anything armored that is capable of inflicting damage here is really nice. Uh, did the other AT gun get blown up? Um, I don't know. I don't know. All I know is that we only have this one. And now he's hemorrhaging core infantry. And German forces will be able to get onto mid here. This Vickers gun oh, gets flanked by just swarms of angry Panzer Grenadiers. That is likely to be game. I. It's so difficult to see a line back here for Caesar. Um, it's just going to be so difficult. Tommy's here, going to come up desperately to shield. And in fact, you know what? We never had the five-man squad upgrade come down this game, did we? Yeah, we just never had the five-man squad upgrade come down. Huh. Brumbar on the queue here. Hang on, wait. What happened to the panther? Wait. That's a centaur. Sorry, I got so confused. I Sorry, I, th I thought Vermac was up here for a second. 
Okay, yeah, so obviously the panther is fine. <laughs> it's a centaur. Wow, I don't think I've seen a centaur for like 50 years. All right, fair enough. Uh, the sniper is probably going to die here. A split second's worth of focus fire. There we go. The pintle mount going to splash onto him. Oh, God. He's, he's going to try and fall back. But nope. Too many angry panzer grenadiers. Uh, the QF6 pounder will be knocked out by the very unit it's meant to counter. As we often see in Company of Heroes, tank guns. Very fragile. And, uh, yeah. This is too much Axis stuff. Somehow, UKF forces are going to go across here and grab east, though. Oh my goodness. And somehow, actually, PGH just doesn't actually have anything literally grabbing mid. This is a bit of an oversight. Just grabbing it with one of these MGs or even a pack gun would be fine right now. No UKF forces remain. We're going to have a 9.75 inch flame mortar support, but it ain't going to be enough. Not by half here. A centaur. We never get to see the centaur, and I feel like we're never going to even see this centaur in this game. It's just, it's faster than I remember, actually. But it's not fast enough, and indeed, Caesar there, gonna GG out. <sighs> Wow. That's a brutal game right there. Caesar playing very well for quite a long time there. But the Firefly felt strange, didn't it? The Firefly felt like an odd choice. Definitely, you know, we've seen the Comet define the meta for UKF. And I think it's fair to say uh, that the Comet would have been a lot better there. Because although the Panther is a strong unit, it wasn't really the problem, was it? Uh, the problem was the overwhelming power of Ostropan, Panzer Grenadiers, and the triple or quad MG or whatever. It was triple MG, wasn't it? So, wow. There we go. What a, uh, what a brutal game that was. So let's take a look here onto the live game ladder and we'll see what we see. So we've got Kanji and Kanji. Angry Dutchman and Iroa. Kanji and Hyling, and from here it just gets a little bit, a little bit nothingy. So I guess I am inclined to cast OKW versus Soviets, a Kanji off. See what we get here. Pineapple fruit. What does a Kenshi mean? Uh, where are you reading a Kenshi? Did I click on someone who was called a Kenshi? Probably. Oh, Kanji. Uh, sorry. Okay. No, I call them Kanji. All right. I'll introduce the players, then we'll explain that for you, Pineapple. So, spawning in the north as the OKW forces, it is going to be Kanji. And spawning in the south as the Soviet forces, it's going to be Kanji. Um, so, yeah, essentially, I, I call them Kanji because um, I study Japanese, and in Japanese they use Chinese characters, but when you use Chinese characters in Japanese, they're called Kanji. They're not really called kanji. If you were to just point at Chinese characters like this and say, hey, look, a load of kanji, people would correctly say, you're wrong to call them kanji there. Those are Chinese characters. Um, but because in the context of my studies, I've always known them as kanji. And this, this, in this con this is Japanese here. So the, the, in these here, that's a Chinese character. That one's a Chinese character. That one's a Chinese character. And so are these two. But this is a Japanese name. You can tell because it has this hiragana here. Um, so... They are kanji here, but here they are not kanji, even though they're the same character. Well, they're, even though they're characters from the same Chinese, um, like alphabet, if you like. Um, but I just call them kanji because I can't read the Chinese characters in these names. I just they they just say kanji to me, so that's why I call them kanji. Because the the names involve characters that I cannot read. That is why. Sorry, um, sorry, I was slightly distracted by something popping up on my other screen there. But that's taken care of now. Okay, OKW versus Soviets, and immediately we've got two commander picks here as well. It's going to be Elite Armor Doctrine. Cool. Um, and that's going to be up against Guard Motor Coordination Tactics. Um, I'm still not the biggest fan of Guard Motor Coordination Tactics, if I'm honest. It's, um, it's clearly a great Soviet commander, and it does a lot of really useful stuff. 
Um, but I actually don't like the 120 mil mortar tube. I think that's kind of wasted. Uh, everything else that the commander gives you, I think, is, is absolutely fine and you can get really useful value out of. But the 120 mil mortar tube sticks out as a kind of like, ugh, you know, I wish, I wish it was the Dushka. If it was the Dushka on this commander, this commander would be sick, but it's not. So that's really tough. Uh, I think you're right, Daton. I think people do just, um, I think people do just, uh, play this because it's it amplifies the sort of default soviet style if you just want to do soviet stuff then this commander will help you out in almost every phase of the game because guards are solid the t3485 is a nice option it's nice to be able to repair it and mark vehicle just gives you that little bit of extra help you need sometimes to close out a kill on a panzer 4 or whatever it is that you're stalking so it's a cool commander yeah and it's been one of the ones that i've used since the game's release i've always felt really confident and really sort of safe using this commander but just because I like a commander and I feel competent and safe with it, that doesn't necessarily mean that I would recommend it to players at the top end of the ladder. And I just feel like there are other Soviet commanders that have more to offer at the top end of the game. That's my feeling. It sort of baffles me that we see this commander on rosters so often and taken so often because it's really hard to point at moments in games where I feel like it's actually changed things. So... So there we go. Yeah, oof indeed, getting bullied. It's been a while since we've seen Soviet forces put on such a dominating display here. Pushing right up. Conscripts dealing with Volks Grenadiers. Uh, this is tough. Yeah, this is really tough here for, um, for, for OKW. I'm just going to call it OKW and Soviet, I think, because, you know, I can't call them both kanji. Well, I mean, I can, but it's not very clear if I do that. So, uh, yeah. Uh, getting bullied indeed. You have to feel like a 221 scout car would be a terrific buy right now. You're getting bullied by conscripts. The 221 correctly microed is a really good way of just chipping away at them. And it does scale pretty well into the late game as well. I really like the way they've redone the Elite Armor Doctrine Commander. It's got a, a lot to offer now. A lot to offer. Um, it used to, it used to just be such a lukewarm commander but now that they've given this super interesting 221 element to it so you have something to do with this commander in the early game and it's not just something it's actually a pretty useful thing that okw like can really make use of so yeah i think this this is just one of the sweeter commanders and then if you could ever actually survive to get out a panzer 4 or any other tank then this commander really starts coming into its own because you know you get the vehicle repair you get the tank commander you get the heat shells uh, or the what are they are they called heat shells yeah uh, and then, you know, if the game goes on long enough, you get the Storm Tiger, which is hilarious fun. Whoa, that is a lot of conscripts barbecuing there. Whew. That was a little bit of a, a moment missed there. He kind of uh, didn't look at those, those squads for a couple of seconds. And some of the conscripts formed up into the bubble of fire and then got roasted for a little longer than they needed. And that is actually going to be like nearly half the Soviet army that's forced out. And that's going to enable um, OKW to push forward onto the doorstep of the Soviet base now. So, okay, Molotov research has been done, giving these uh, Axis troopers a little bit of a taste of their own medicine now. Wow, it's actually a fairly rare game, I feel like, that we see Molotov research ever get done. 10 fuel and 80 manpower. The cost on that one, gosh, yeah, we, we very, very rarely see that one there. Yeah, good point, Daton. Even if you have the commander on your roster... Don't pick it at the nought command points. It literally doesn't do anything. You are quite right. It's not like we have radio intercepts hidden away on this commander. It's like, that's not a thing. So, um, yeah, I... <clears throat> I think on the ladder, it is... It is my most frequently observed sin, is that, <laughs> or if you like, that players just way too often just pick a commander right when the game starts. And it's like... That is not a good thing to do, right? You know you're giving up value by doing that. Just... Just... I... I just wish players would do it less often. There's a similar thing, actually, uh, unrelated, I guess, but similar, which is in in um in Magic: The Gathering, when players play a forbidden passage, uh, a fabled passage, sorry, they play a fabled passage and then they crack it immediately when they were on the player or something, and like, it's just free information for me. Like, wait till the end of my turn before you do that. You're gaining nothing. You're pulling the trigger on something seriously early, and you're giving up value because of it. That's that's why it reminds me of it. Anyway. Um. All right, conscripts are starting to have a tough time finding value out on the map right now. I like pushing up into the north. There's no Axis forces here, so he's going to make quite a good land grab up here. Uh, grabbing fuel, grabbing munitions, decently spreading his units there to grab a lot of ground. Flak half-track, actually, is going to be the unit here. Sorry, it's going to be a battle group at HQ. Didn't mention that yet. So, yep, flak half-track on the way. And this one here... 
ought to be fairly commanding, but you know what, actually? Guards infantry have already just been called in, so they do really help against the uh, flak half-track. Obviously, the PTRSs are a decent way of controlling valuable light armor like that. And, uh... Hey, what's going on, Jay? Jay Candon? <laughs> good. good to see you in chat there. I've not seen that emote before. That is that's an amusing one. I like that guy. Um... Yeah, so the PTR as equipped guards are going to be really useful here. And the DPLMGs have been purchased. So they are basically the kingmaker on the field now. I feel like the story of these guards over the next few minutes is going to be the story of this game. If they're able to control the flak half-track, the Soviet player is going to be doing well. If they get caught out and have to fall back repeatedly, well, it's going to be uh, OKW who are going to flourish. That's the way I feel that this is going to pan out for the next minute or two. And immediately, actually, they're going to hit some shoe mines. So that's... Uh, a little bit of a shame there. That's a bit annoying there for the Soviet player. Uh, hope he picks up AT grenades. It should already be done. Wow, he hasn't picked up AT grenades. Okay. Wow. Okay, well, he's going to click on that button like as soon as he sees the flag half track for sure. All right, there it is. Actually, immediately gets uh, hit by a PTRS, so that's nice. And then the fallback comes down promptly to enable these guards to get back in the fighting condition there. So, a nice opening engage there. Even just dinking the flak half-track with a, um... Oh, somebody just hit some mines. Yep, yep. These shoe mines starting to take a toll on the Soviet forces. But yeah, getting one PTRS slug into the flak half-track is a nice thing. And it just feeds, a, feeds quite a, a lot of veterancy onto those guards. So, that's a good thing to have gotten. Trip mines here going to be slaying. Wow, these guys really getting use out of their sort of booby trap and mine style abilities, aren't they? Conscripts are just capping and AT nade tools. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that is their like tactical description as per Soviet commanders of the of the era. Yes, <laughs> conscripts are um, the glue that holds the Soviet army together. But nobody really has a lot of respect for glue. Nobody ever stops and says, "Hey, glue, how you doing?" And I feel like conscripts, yeah, that was their lot in life. Danton's actually with a really good point, actually. Yeah, conscript merge is a real thing that's super useful. Okay, so... A fight is going to be taken here. Triple cap is established and double fuel about to be. So, uh, Soviet forces need to get some work done here. Hey, uh, the Zisk gun is going to get a mixed in, and that's going to help here. The flak half-track actually just not committing into the fight. Oh, sorry, the flak half-track, here we go. It's going to transition across now, but that is a little slow. Guards here with the DP is going to be laying into these Storm Pioneers, but the heavy cover is here, actually. Okay, finally he gets the fallback. I think that fallback was possibly a little premature. I guess he was losing this position here because of the flamethrower, but still, you could probably have traded. They were trading just fine, those units. So, anyway, gonna fall them back. Flat half track here is gonna. Oh, get, oh, get some nice shots into these uh, engineers. They're so low, but they will sneak away. Kettenworth are now present on the OKW roster. And I don't know, do we need a second squad of guards? I actually think I would like a second squad of guards here. Also, the Soviet player is also stacking a ton of fuel, so. Uh, it would be quite. Okay, here comes the Tank of your Battalion Command. But it, it, this is gonna be a late T70. I don't think we wanna go for T70 now. Not. I mean, your opponent just already has Kettenworth, uh, and... Oh, this gun Barrage here, catching a couple of Volk squads. Nicely done there. That was a good shot. Do you need something? But the Soviet player is beginning to fall dangerously far behind on the scoreline here. Dangerously far. This triple cap is really leeching the Soviet forces' reserves here. And if you fall too far behind in these stages of the game, you will be obliged to play to play some pretty bad positions later on. Yeah, sometimes conscripts do just die when they merge into another unit. You're right. But it's always nice to have the option, right? And it's it's like the same call as when you try to like pick up a machine gun off the floor when you're under fire. You, you just have to make the judgment call. Like, do I think that, 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 that the infantry models I'm replenishing that machine gun with are actually going to survive to get the machine gun out? Sometimes you get it wrong, but it's always nice to have the option. Fair Panzer HQ is established. And the Soviet player is just about breaking out onto the map. Finally grabs a victory point. Finally grabs a fuel point. 
finally going to challenge for mid here. But if we get crushed here and the German player just retakes the flank, then... I mean, we've hemorrhaged a lot of tickets over the last phase of play here. Is this gun going to be used to just force some Volks Grenadiers out of this fight here? But the Flak Half-Track reigning supreme. So, I would love to see a mechanized armor campanile come down next. That would make me very happy. Just about to have the manpower for that. What is this guy doing just like so far away from his squad? I love how Company of Heroes does that sometimes. It's just like, no, one of the infantry models is just way over here. These this gun barrages are kind of on point. It's 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 amusing to see. I'm not convinced that they're worth it. They still cost what thirty five munitions a pop, but it's nice to see the this gun keeping the Axis player on their toes. The this gun barrage is actually another ability that's kind of in a weird spot in the game at the moment. Now that I think about it, I think I think Soviet forces were kind of balanced around having that, like be used a lot more often to counter Axis weapon teams. And at the moment, I feel like. It's both too powerful and too expensive. I would like it if Soviet players could use it more often, but it but if it gave the Axis player a little bit more warning that it was happening, so that they could try to sort of do some counterplay. Because at the moment it has to cost 35, because the first shot comes out really quick and often squad wipes if it hits. So like, or has a lot of squad wiping potential, let's put it that way. Um, Schwer Panzer HQ here actually going to do a great job of defending this fuel point. I love, I love it when OKW players put the put the Schwer Panzer HQ here. I think it's my favourite spot on this map because this this is actually pretty easy to defend, um, and it will cover the fuel point, and that's kind of huge. I mean, as we just saw, that that forced a few Soviet units back and protected the fuel point. Uh, Obersoldatner out, of course. STGs as well, finishing up on a number of these Volk squads. So uh, I think our Soviet player here is. I mean, the triple cap is nice. We've had a we've had a nice little push out here, but I worry that the Soviet player is just being out teched here. This Axis army looks su su substantially more sophisticated and better constructed. Molotov comes down here. Kanji on top of the fullback, though. Oh man, these STG Volks. Conscripts just can't hold the tide, really, against STG Volks. They do not have the chops. Panzer IV for the Axis player? Um, yeah. Uh, um, I think a Panzer IV looks absolutely fine here. Um, it dominates pretty much everything that the Soviet player has. And any responsive forces from the Soviet player, you're basically fine with for the Axis player. I mean, what does the Soviet player do? Buy more Zisk guns? That's fine. Go for an SU-85? That's fine. Even going for a T-34-85 is like, as the Axis player, you are happy with that. That's, that's just a real big old cost. So yeah, I think the Panzer IV is fine. I think it's uh, better than fine. I think it's excellent. Uh, what is it? 145 fuel for OK Dubs? 140. Okay. And like the thing is also like vet 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 nothing this guns against the OKW Panzer Four. They actually don't even do that reliable of damage. Like it's okay, but it's not. You know, because they miss quite a lot, and the added armor on the OKW Panzer IV is like, they actually bounce an annoying amount of the time as well. Another Zisk gun barrage going to come down here. I'm not quite sure. What is this, the fourth Zisk gun barrage? So that's like 140-odd munitions that really could have been doing better things. And it will be a T-34. I believe that's the 85 there that we see on the queue. Let me just check. That is the 85. Hmm. I wasn't anticipating the Soviet player to get the T-34-85 out before the Axis player got the Panzer IV out. So, is he saving for Storm Tiger? Because, like, definitely could have purchased the uh, the Panzer IV by now. So, um, Datton, whilst I think that the Panzer IV is probably the best thing to do, it isn't seemingly what the OKW player is doing. Or it might just be that the OKW player kind of wants to see how the Soviet player is going to spend their fuel before making the choice, and that's fine as well. So perhaps we'll see a response once this T-34 reveals itself. That is the least appropriate camouflage for a map I might have ever seen. 
Good stun grenade gonna come down. Oh, I say good, actually. He stunned, stunned all of the uh, Storm Pioneers as well. Alright, the T3485 reveals itself. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do now, OKW? What's the plan here? Hmm? Got all this fuel. What are we gonna do? The Storm Tiger button is lit. I'm just saying. It's lit. Da -da 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 -da. It's lit. I mean, he ain't going for a KT, right? The tech isn't here. Or at least could still transition into KT. But I mean, I just don't like it when OK, OKW players, like at this at the 17, 18 minute mark in the game, are like committing to KT. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Read the room, man. Like, you're so far ahead. Like, are you sure you want to you sure you want to go for a plan that makes this game go on for as long as possible when you've had a this strong 18 minute start? Like, I don't think so. So I'm hoping it's not going to be a, K a KT plan. That even if it wins the game, it just it's it's not a very efficient line, if you ask me. I'm so curious though, because he's up to 200 fuel. What are we doing here? Up, oh, bit of a lag spike there, but we made it through. Yeah, let me go on that. What are the other commander abilities that Axis has, um, other than the heat rounds? Oh, okay, so you've got the tank commander, um, which can call in artillery strikes, and I believe it also uh, increases the vehicle line of sight. Yeah, um, so it's an it's an interesting upgrade, but bear in mind it competes with the pintle mount, so it's not just like a no-brainer. Um, you get the vehicle crew repairs, the emergency repairs, so it lets your tanks um, repair critical. It's a panther. We're going for a panther. Okay. Um, yeah, so you get the vehicle crew repairs here. Um, uh, it takes 15 seconds, and it makes the crew really vulnerable. Uh, it's it's kind of probably the least good of the vehicle crew repair abilities in the game. Or, well, I don't know. I just It just doesn't seem that great to me. It's it's fine, but it's it doesn't compare very well to, say, United States vehicle crews, or even the this one, the vehicle crew repair training. Uh, you get the 221 half-track, which is pretty damn cool, and, of course, the Storm Tiger. So yeah, those are the options that you get there for the uh, Elite Armor Doctrine, uh, Daten. So it is a Panther tank, and the OKW Panther is pretty damn intimidating. How much fuel is that bad boy? Well, we're going to look in a second because we've got a fight here. The Panther is going to be utilizing its superior range and armor penetration to push back the T-3485. A Zis gun will prevent the Panther from overrunning too far, though. The guards, infantry, and engineers desperately doing as best they can. No player at any point in this game, actually, interestingly enough, investing in a machine gun. So all infantry just getting to function unimpeded with very little in the way of suppression. I appreciate the flak half-track can do a little bit, but wasn't actually firing into that fight there. So, yeah, it's pretty... Uh, Interesting that neither player on Feynmanville as well, neither player going for a machine gun, like, okay. Um, weird stuff. Uh, I think the Soviet player for sure needs a second engineer squad. One squad of engineers will not repair your tanks fast enough. Even a single T-3485, Soviet engineers are like pretty slow on the repairs. Having said that though, they are two star, right? And that is the improved, yeah. That's when they get the improved repair speed. All right, so may may maybe it is actually acceptable. Um, and we're coming up to having enough fuel, actually, to think about making another armored choice for the Soviet player, either. Um, Drunken Dwarf, you think a 120 would be nice. A 120, a 120. I'm having a slow morning this morning, man. I don't know what it is. My head feels super foggy. What, what, a 120? Which, which one's a 120? Sorry, buddy. Oh, you mean the mortar tube? Uh, yeah. That's actually interesting. Yeah, this is like one of the one situation where I think possibly a 120 tube looks okay. But to be honest, you know, I'd probably just prefer a PM81 or two PM81s. But anyway, it's going to be a Katusha. That's actually spicy. I, I like the Katusha pick. This I didn't think about, but I like it. T3485 going to reveal itself to try and deal with the flak half-track. Opusol Darton in jeopardy, but they will escape. And the 85mm cannon unable to find its mark against the front armor of this imperious-looking Panther tank. Um, and that is going to be a T-3485 that has to retreat for now to repair. As these two players continue skirting around mid, but 166 tickets means that the Soviet player will be compelled to try and hold mid here. And that's going to be a difficult thing. Now, finally, a machine gun gets mixed in. And, uh, is that where we meant to place that machine gun? And, uh, you know, oh, is this gun barrage here going to be used to try and push that one back? But, uh, what was I just... What was I just saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when the game is about controlling victory points, obviously, machine guns look pretty smart. Oh, man, this machine gun getting 
getting hammered. Wow, not the start in life that you want for your machine guns. Thalas Mara, what's going on, friend? Good to see you in chat. Do the commander improve anti-infantry damage on the panther? No. It does not. Katusha Barrage being used at close range to break some Volks here, and that's nice. Finding some damage, lobbing out some rockets, good stuff. Only killing two Volks, actually. That's slightly fewer than I thought, but that's okay. It's nice to pick up some value. Emma Duranki, what's going on, friend? Good to see you. Oh, I, yeah, that's a good point, Daten. Okay. <laughs> I suppose if you put the tank commander on the panther, which we do have, then you can call in the artillery. And the artillery is potentially very good against infantry, yeah. Um, how much is that tank commander artillery? It's 80 munitions, yeah. And it, you actually only get relatively few shells. It's like a little smattering of shells, so... It's useful. It's not great. That's my feeling on the tank commander artillery. Emma Duranke, what did you miss? Well, you missed an interesting Wehrmacht versus UKF featuring Panzergrenadier and Griefen against um, Caesar. And uh, a close run thing. Really interesting game. Um, so, uh, yeah, a real good one. I won't spoil that one for you in case you fancy checking out the VODs on YouTube. But um, always good to see two top tier players. Caesar may be my favorite UKF player at the moment. Just plays such a solid, interesting style. And of course, PGA, a very talented, uh, interesting player. Um, OKW player there. Oh, thank you, Thalas Mara. Yeah. I'm looking forward to having a good week as well. Fingers crossed, eh? Thank God the weather is broken here, so it's not, like, perilously hot anymore. Okay, so... As the dust settles on another engagement... Um, the precious Soviet victory point stash dwindles ever further. Plus one for Caesar. Yep. I agree, Emma Duranke. He's just uh, he's just got a certain way, a certain way, and also still probably the best UKF sniper player I've seen in recent times. Like, just not afraid to pull that bad boy out and get value out of it in any stage of the game. <laughs> Gets a wipe on some uh, some over, uh, some Volks grenadiers there. Did you see that that one rocket just whoop, just took him out? That was real nice. Uh, indeed a nice infantry roster for both sides. I, I would like, I mean, I appreciate that we can't afford it and we're desperately, desperately lacking for manpower for the Soviet player, but I would have liked a second squad of guards at some point. If you can get up to double guard with double DP, like that... I am quite happy if you can hide them behind conscripts and just let them do their work. They're really nice. Have we seen any squad wipes yet, Drunk Dwarf? Uh, well, we did just see one um, to that to that second Katusha barrage. But outside of that, uh, no, I don't think we have seen any squad wipes now. I think about it. Yeah, the, yeah, the Katusha did just take out a super vetted up STG equipped Volk squad, so that was pretty nice. Uh, Obersol Darton here, going to be forced out of the fight. Trading super bad to these conscripts somehow. Um, and uh, the Panther here is going to secure the flank. Soviet forces crucially get onto this victory point. Bit clustered up for my liking, but they will do that. And they also get onto mid here. So Soviet here taking their responsibility to have to look after the victory point seriously here. Well, there's a lot of STGs. And uh, that's the, uh, that's the uh, SUM... Um, sorry, the Ziskun Barrage here. Going to start flailing on into these, uh, these troops. But the dodge is there. I, Soviet player here has spent so many munitions on Ziskun barrages, and they haven't really paid off. I mean, there have been a couple of nice hits, but on average, not not finding a lot of value for those munitions spent. So that's a bit of a risk. T3485 going to sneak away here. The Panther wants to wants to keep fighting it, and it has so much health it could definitely stay here. The tank commander barrage to, is going to come down to force the Ziskun to move. So there we go. Uh... But when the dust settles, it's still okay. Oh, he lost the engineers at some point as well, actually. Yeah. Oh, Daten, you spotted it at the exact same time I did, Daten. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There were some two-star Soviet engineers on the field, and they have been wiped. And it, the manpower right now for the Soviet player is being pulled so many different ways. You are obliged to keep reinforcing your squads, because if you relent your pressure on controlling these victory points for even a moment, you will lose the game. Uh, and then you also really want a second squad of engineers. Vet Zero Soviet engineers do not repair rapidly. Um, and you'd love to buy, like, a machine gun or a mortar or more guards. And, mo most importantly, you really need to spend your fuel. 
and you will need manpower to do so. So, yeah, this is a really rough place for Soviet player here, and uh, I mean, they're going to get out from under the clock again at 117 tickets. John 117, the luckiest Spartan. Uh, but, uh, yep, going to get out from under the clock, and the Zisk on his barrage is just irresistible sometimes. Yeah, I get that. Sometimes you just want to make your opponent's units explode. But that's why I like to invest in units that get to do that for free. Okay, Datton. Yeah, that's a fair point. They have done a lot of damage. And to be fair, even where the German player has dodged the Ziskun Barrage, at least it requires them to dodge the Ziskun Barrage. And if your opponent is moving your units around, that does that is moving their units around, that does make them less efficient in a fight. Often Oftentimes in RTS, it's enough to make it so that your opponent has to reposition and move their forces rather than just directly fighting you in a fight. Um, case in point, Banelings. Like, when Banelings roll in, it is often enough that all the Terran player is having to do is make sure their Marines are not being hit by Banelings. And, like, if they're doing that, then the Marines are not shooting. And even if the Banelings don't hit, that, that Marines not shooting is massive. So that's pretty cool. Sam Fisher BC, am I going to play some Company of Heroes 2 when streaming? Yeah, sure, I think it's going to happen one day. I have to be careful at the moment because I actually get really bad RSI. Um, so playing RTSs, I have to be careful with. But I've been doing exercises and building up some strength and um, I'm probably in a place where I can actually play Company of Heroes 2 again now. So um, yeah, yeah, that's probably going to happen sometime. I like asterisk warning. Nice Katusha Barrage, by the way. It does pick up the, uh, it does pick up the, um, the Rakatenwerfer. But um, asterisk warning. I will probably be seriously bad at the game because I have not played it properly for like literally years. Um, so I'm going to be really bad. It's going to probably take me a few games before I'm like get my eye back in. Um, and also, of course, there have been so many changes since last time I was playing. So it's going to feel very different to play. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, Avas and Storm Tigers, the real va it's nice if you get hits, but the real value is in just that your opponent has to respect the fact that they that, that you might fire. And that is often more powerful than firing. So yeah, I see where you're coming from there, Amadaranki. Please tell me he got AT grenades by now. Oops. Uh, yes, he got AT grenades by now, yeah. SU eighty five? Okay. Interesting. And a Panzer IV for the Axis player. Well, I actually think the SU-85 makes a lot of sense because you are struggling with this Panther and your Axis opponent is only going to be buying more armor and the SU-85 is good against armor. So it makes sense. It does make sense. I also think that this SU-85 is late. Normally you want an SU-85 a bit earlier than this because it vets up really nice and SU-85s are a long-term investment. You want them to be alive for as long as possible so that they can make use of their veterancy. Um... So this SU-85 is kind of late. I appreciate he hasn't had the manpower to spend the fuel before now, so that's why. Um, and I also feel like, actually, the Axis player can kind of deal with this. Uh, where, did the Rakatenwerfer get destroyed? It did, okay, all right. But even with just a Panzer IV and a Panther, you know, the SU-85 is so easy to outmaneuver and flank, and if that happens even once, you lose it. So he's going to try and put, probably position the SU-85 around here and use focus sight mode to search for targets in the fog of war. And oh, he's already rolled it far too too far forwards. He's come for, he's come too far forwards. What are we doing? <gasps> this is a really bad place for the SU-85. Whoa! This is he wanted it here. As soon as you cross this line, the reason why crossing this line is important. Let me just move the camera to show you. Is if you are here, it's very easy to cover this angle. If you go past this line, it's almost impossible to cover this angle, and that's where the Panther was. So if, as soon as you cross this line with the SU-85, you are inviting the Panther to come in and, and counter your SU-85. And, you know, okay, the Panther didn't have the health to do it, and the Panzer IV is not in position. I appreciate that, but that was a risky moment. Now, hang on. Over this last phase of play, I missed another Volk squad going down, I guess, to a Katusha barrage. Um, and with the SU-85 to command the middle of the map... This is a bad position for the SU-85. Oh, this makes me so annoyed. Sorry. He, he's got it against a movement blocker that's behind it. So that's terrible, because the number one thing you want your SU-85 to be able to do at the first sign of danger is kite. And if you park it in front of something like that, it cannot kite, and that is terrible. Also, this position is kind of bad because you're getting screened off so massively by this. Um, so, yeah. I don't like parking it there. Katusha here going to take another barrage. 
So there's a speculative barrage into the base here. Kill some medics. I mean, that is actually value. Those medics have a relatively slow spawn rate. Um, so now there's only one medic alive, right? That's really annoying. Um, that is actually going to make this uh, OKW army less efficient. Another truck comes out. Okay. Angling for the potential of a KT here as this game goes on. Just as an insurance policy, in case the Soviet player is stubborn enough to be alive by the time we can afford that KT. And that does make sense. Soviet forces, again, get out from under the clock at 54 tickets. So, you know, Soviet here, doing some work here. Obersoldat, I'm going to make a dash for mid, under the cover of the MG. And it is th this MG is beginning to really be very, very, very valuable in this game. Look, I mean, if your opponent cannot get onto the victory points... They're not going to be able to win the game, and it's because of this MG that these OKW, sorry, these are Obersold Art, and have been able to decap mid here. So the Panther here, oh, the SU-85 is going to come forwards. This is risk, my friend. He's going to kite it back again. Ziskun here holding the line. Katusha nosing forwards, but nothing ready. Is that just a scare tactic? I think he's trying to scare the Obersold Art away. But, um, you know, it looks like OKW was paying attention and knows that that Katusha cannot be ready for another barrage just yet. And uh, uh, he's... He's, he's back under the clock, 52 tickets and ticking. Needs to get something onto this point, but look how good this machine gun is being. It's so torturously excruciating watching this machine gun just dominate your infantry. They could, they just need a few more meters and this game would be okay, but the machine gun is winning. This is, I feel like we need a mortar for smoke now, but I appreciate that the, uh, the uh, Soviet player will also want to spend their fuel on a unit that probably doesn't have smoke, so yeah. What's up, James? Good to see you in chat, man. Thanks for showing out today. What's going on? OKW, OKW has lost a lot of infantry. You're right, Thalasmara. Uh, and he's still managing map control on the back of these very powerful panzers and that machine gun. It is this machine gun that is pulling weight right now. It's pulling so much weight that the Katusha feels obliged to spend a whole barrage just to get it to pack up and move. Jeez. Oh, man. Four-star Obersoldaten literally point blank shooting fish in a barrel pinned conscripts feels bad for the soviet player man but uh 20 tickets triple cap established i do believe that's game as there are no soviet units able to recapture those victory points there and i feel like i feel like this was a game that the axis player was dominating throughout all stages but n notice how incredibly value the presence of the one machine gun that was bought in this entire game was if, if you think the game is going to devolve into a grind fest for the victory points, and that's what happened here, uh, then machine guns are going to be your best friend. So, that yeah, that, that machine gun, like, ended that game. Otherwise, the game could have gone on longer, and who knows what happens if that game goes on longer. Um, James, did you miss much? Uh, you missed a really sick game, or I, I really enjoyed it, between um, Caesar and Panzer Grenadier and Griefen. Caesar bringing their sort of really cool style of UKF. Um, so that was a nice one. Yeah, you can catch the VOD on, uh, on on my channel on YouTube if you want. It'll it'll take a couple of it'll take like an hour or two to upload after the stream finishes, but that was a cool game. It wasn't like oh my god, like the besterest game of all time, but it was just a really good game. So we've got TIE Flyger and Kanji on Nexus. We've got Den Sovenda Draga and I Am Nice Person. Ooh, don't really recognize them. Alpern and this one on Langraskaya. Huh, that actually could be a good one. Um, but I feel like we're probably going to jump in here and cast this Nexus game. Oh, it's a Baruna was, Bra was Brazilian? Oh, cool. I know so little about the players beyond their screen names. I mean, well, I know I know so little about so many of the players. There are some players that I really do know something about. And there are even some players who I've literally met and had dinner with, like, once once in London. We were, There was a thing a few years ago where, like, some, some people from com the Company of Heroes 2 crew got together and uh, went out in London, and it was just hilarious. But, um, yeah, it's a Peruna I don't actually know anything about, really. Yeah, so this is one of the guys, Daten. This is um, this is the Soviet player from the previous game. So we are actually following their story here. Uh, and uh, so, okay. Spawning in the east here on Nexus is the OKW forces. It's going to be Typhlyger. And a spawning in the west as the Soviet forces. Coming off the back of a loss, but looking pretty like a pretty good player still. Uh, it is going to be our Kanji Soviet here.
and Itapiruna sounds like a South American anteater type creature. <laughs> to me, it sounds like some like really lean looking reef fish, or like a, an Itapiruna. Halfway between a tuna and a barracuda. Oh, wow, it's actually going to be a special rifle command opening. And it's a piranha. Ha! Wow. Okay, it's going to be a rifle command opening. Interesting. Okay. Well, penal battalion on the way. Oh, uh, no. Oh, wow, defensive doctrine as well. Cool. I like this commander more. I do like this commander more, although it still has the sort of limp the limp fish the limp what what am i trying to say the, i just i just feel that the damp squib that's that's what that's the phrase isn't it it's got the 120 mil mortar squad which i i still maintain as a bit of a damp squib to be honest it's a peruna means black stone is that right that's cool no 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 damp squib james it's a squib s q UIB. Um, little known fact, um, squib. A squib is a, a very, like, a fairly primitive, like, old-fashioned firework. Um, so when people say, oh, it was a bit of a damp squib, it, like, that's a phrase which meant, like, you know, it was a letdown because it was, like, you know, like a damp firework, you know. It's a, it's a British expression, yeah, damp squib. It's a... Uh, it is a British saying, yeah, I think so, anyway. So we've got the full Penal Battalion plus uh, Scout Car package going down here. And it's going to be a Panzer Fusilier build here from Typhlyger, who's gone for the Grand Offensive Doctrine. Uh, that's what we're going to be rocking with here. Whoops. So my understanding is that the Panzer Fusiliers are less, pardon me, less dps -y with their rifles than Volks Grenadiers, except at long range. And um, and that they basically only compete in terms of DPS once they get those G43s, and then they are a little bit better than your uh, than your Volks Grenadiers. Of course, they also have the option for the Panzer Shreks, which is nice to have on a sort of core infantry style squad. So um, yeah, they're a, a very versatile package, but they are more expensive and and just have less raw damage than Volks Grenadiers in these stages of the game. At your average, in your average engagement, anyway. So, uh, Ty Flyger going to be mixing two and two when it comes to Volks and Panzer Grenadiers. And the uh, flamethrower engineers are now out. They're going to fix up that scout car and then probably hop aboard for some good old clown car mischief, some wholesome family entertainment, some Soviet communist. Fire spreading. Nobody, nobody owns this flamethrower. Nobody owns this burning fuel. It is for everybody. They are distributing it to the people, even the people of other nations. So generous is communism that these engineers will distribute burning fuel to the members of other nations. A gift from from Soviet Russia to fascist Germany. Yeah, pseudo flame half track. That's a good way of thinking about it. Okay. Kind of just waiting for this game to literally warm up. It seems like he didn't actually. He's opting to use this scout car more as a kind of Kuba wagon than a than an actual clown car, as we're used to seeing. I mean, Fausts are done now, so this this clown car not likely to be long for this world. But kind of using it more as a Kuba wagon, albeit a Kuba wagon that doesn't capture and costs 15 fuel. Touch awkward, perhaps. <laughs> wow, it's super windy out there at the moment. Jeez. I hope that that wind isn't catching on the mic, actually. Christ.
Yeah, open top transport. Oh, was the APC in Red Alert 2 the one where, like, depending on what infantry you put in it, it had a different weapon? <laughs> Communism includes the right to be equally as on fire as the next guy, absolutely. Uh, man, yeah, a lot of talk about CNC recently, because CNC Remastered has come out. I, I, CNC Remastered for me is fantastic fun, but it's it's almost unplayable as an RTS experience. I have a lot of fun with it, but the trouble is, it is literally a game from the 90s, right? I mean, it's a remaster. They, they haven't tried to innovate, they haven't tried to iterate. It's slightly better in a couple of ways, like you can queue units and there's a couple of very slight changes to the game, but it is a game from the 90s and it does play like that game. And that's the intention, and that's great. But RTSs nowadays are so much better thought out and more sophisticated, and we have so many more layers of knowledge about what makes a good RTS than we did in the 90s. That I, it's not, it's for me, it's actually very difficult to just play it because it's kind of terrible, like objectively. If you're used to Company of Heroes 2, or if you're used to StarCraft 2, or if you're used to modern RTSs, and then you just go and play Command and Conquer Remastered, like out on the ladder, you will be frustrated. Like unit pathing is terrible, like there's a lot of problems with it. But Command and Conquer 3 Kane's Wrath is absolutely amazing. Like, that is just a great RTS in every way. Like, the the unit design, the graphics, it, like, the, the way the fights take place, it's such a dynamic game. And I've been watching some high-level Command and Conquer 3 Kane's Wrath um, games recently, and I have gotten a real appreciation for that game, man. Like, watching somebody pack up their MCV and do a base push against another player, and seeing the, like, ebb and flow and the battle for control of Tiberium, it's so fierce. Like... It's actually just amazing to watch. I would, I am seriously thinking about trying to cast some Command and Conquer Three Kings Wrath moving forwards. And apparently, the scene for it is massive, man. There were like tournaments going on last month, which had like twenty-two thousand viewers, and I'm like, okay, like <laughs> that that interests me. So there we go. Um, Emma Duranke, if you want to dip your toe into the Command & Conquer universe, I, I would recommend um, some of the stuff that's on sale in the Steam sale, rather than the remaster necessarily, unless you actually really have the nostalgia for the remaster. Um, that's what I'd recommend. Calling it a 90s RTS, is, there are several 90s that are still un... Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're right, Daton. There are still some 90s RTSs that do offer really amazing things. But I cannot think of any 90s RTS that, in my opinion, doesn't have crucial and big design flaws. Just because we didn't have the understanding back then. Like StarCraft and Bro StarCraft Brood War. Amazing RTS. Still played competitively at a high level and still broadcast in tournaments. Fantastic game. StarCraft Brood War is amazing. But there are things that are so debilitatingly glaring with its design that I find it very frustrating and difficult to play. For example, right? It's not, the game engine does not in no way tells you if your buildings are flush uh, in a way that will prevent zerglings from getting through. You just have to know by experimenting on each different map what combinations of buildings will be an effective wall off for zerglings. And that is incredibly frustrating. It involves a level of learning and commitment. Like you literally have to go and spend like two or three hours learning how to wall off on the different map pool maps, depending on what where you've spawned and what the angle for the zerglings is before you can even think about playing Terran on the ladder. Because otherwise you literally just lose to zerglings and zealots every game. And it's like, well, that's too much for me to deal with. It's just too annoying. I can't be asked. Um, hey, A game. I mean, the, the trouble with A-game is, there is an option to enable grid, but if your buildings are flush in the StarCraft engine, that actually is not not enough. It measures the amount of pixels between the different amounts of the building, and a Zergling is like 27 pixels wide, and it can fit through certain gaps at certain angles, even with flush buildings, my friend. You literally just have to go onto the map editor and mess around until you figure out what is tight and what is not tight on each map. And that is so goddamn frustrating, I can't even imagine. And like... Likewise, for the Protoss players, man, like, Marines can fit through some gaps in some buildings, and, cause pix and because, um, because Zealots are more pixels wide, the Zealots cannot chase them. So if you put a, uh, a supply depot next to a barracks at the right point, the Marines can go through and the Zealot can't. So the Marines go through, shoot your Zealot, the Zealot runs around, then the Marines go through again, shoot the Zealot, and th they mean no amount of Zealots will win that. It's so annoying. Like, so there we go. 
uh, Nostalgia, you, you played the demo version of CNC on PSX. Man, I played CNC exclusively on PlayStation all those years ago. That is my introduction to RTS, was playing CNC on, on PlayStation. No kidding, that was where uh, RTS started in my life. So, it sounds like we got started at nearly the same place there. Also, what's up, A-Game? Welcome aboard. Oh yeah, 12 unit max selection as well. Some people find that really annoying. I found it really annoying, although I do appreciate it lends StarCraft a certain style, which does actually make for some very exciting gameplay. Uh, objectively, watching if I'm watching high level StarCraft, absolutely, leave the 12 unit max selection on because it's hilarious, the things it makes players do, it's great to watch. But is it is it fun to play? Is it is it intuitive or nice? No, it's awful. It's god awful. And like you know, there are loads of RTSs from the like Total Annihilation, arguably the most complete and flawless of the '90s RTSs. But even that had like some massive glaring issues that today we would just patch out. But that's not how it worked. So they have not patched these things. Right, hang on now, because we're 11 minutes 30 into this game, and I've just been ranting about '90s RTSs and what I like and don't like, <laughs> which. Uh, um, which uh, is neither here nor there. So this scout car is still alive. It has been... Oh, he's going to get up on top of this MG with it as well. Sick. Are we going to lob some grenades? Is that... Whoa, why did we get out in front of the arc? That does not seem intuitive. Surely just get out like just behind the arc. Ooh, a bit of a fail there, to be honest. I was quite excited about that and it didn't come through. Okay, so... Oh, these are penals. Sorry, not guards. My bad. Uh, so we've got double Dushka, double guard, double engineer with flamethrower, T70 M5 against double Panzer Fusiliers, double Volks Grenadiers, MG34 uh, uh, Storm Pioneers with Metal Detector, Raketenwerfer. So two well-matched, well-balanced armies here. A uh, bit of a scoreline advantage for the Soviet player. Uh, it's been getting some work done out there. Uh, the resource differential, I've not been paying too much attention, but it seems to be roughly even. Soviet tech is... Uh, at Tank of E, Axis Tech is still at Battle Grip and no sign of second Schwebermack Schlepper. So that's where we're at in this game. It's been a pretty entertaining 12 and a half minutes, to be honest, given that I've been talking about other stuff. Yeah, he did just evac right in front of the MG. Not so great. Pulling a, pulling a wet squid. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, he pulled a wet squid on that one. <laughs> a moist squid. He, he pulled a moist cephalopod on me. He pulled a. What are, what other what other brands of mollusk can we bring in here? It was a it was a damp bivalve. It was a a wet cephalopod, a damp cephalopod. Do I know any other kinds of mollusk? I don't think so, actually. All right. Soviet forces pushing. Live gun on the queue. Oh, I like this as well. I worry about not getting the support weapon Campania, though, because you're going to get punished for lack of Zis guns if this goes, goes on. A tight clam. <laughs> I think it should be a squeaky clam. Somehow that's funnier. I don't know why. Ooh, that's a squeaky clam. Oh, this T-70 there. Getting a bit close to the... Oh, he will get his engine dank, dinked, but he gets out of there. That was a squeaky clam. And the, the Kettenwerfer looking for shots, but not finding them. I, was that the Kettenwerfer? Yeah, the Kettenwerfer was looking for shots there. Thoroughly absorbent sponge. <laughs> the Axis player had a half-track? What, we had a flak half-track this game? Oh, damn, man. I was just... I was spending the first 10 minutes of this game ranting about other RTSs, so uh, clearly I missed that. Okay, he's going to reman the Dushka. He's going to get these units out of here, I really hope. Come on, man. Got to get out of here. And Soviet forces looking decent up in north. Dushka on Overwatch. Conscripts digging in, grabbing fuel. And yeah, things, things, things going pretty well for the Soviet player here. The Axis player needs to just kind of take a deep breath and grab some map control. Here's the Schwerpanzer HQ at last. Coming on out here. Squad is back to full strength. Uh, yeah, another conscript squad would actually be pretty useful for merging. You're right, Daton. 
The double dushka I like, though. Going up to a double dushka is a statement on this map, but I think it's appropriate. I mean, they haven't got the veterancy that I would like to see yet, but they've had to be recruited, um, or one of them has at least once, so... Fingers crossed that those dushkas can go on to flourish. This this map, almost more so, the, more so than many of the other machine gun dominated maps, I think Nexus is the most machine gun important map in the mid and late game. Because like machine gun, like look at this screen and like machine guns are everything when you are trying to play for this point. Like look how many good nests there are for machine guns that dominate this point. So many. So if you, if you can just keep a machine gun basically anywhere on this screen, your opponent won't be getting the middle VP and that's huge. Turns out that that is huge. <laughs> Alright, T70 wrecking face in south here. These Volks Grenadiers will not be allowed to stay around anymore. The Soviet position in north remains unassailable, and this Dushka is just creeping in here. But some Panzerfusiliers find their way around the arc. There are shoe mines in mid as well, so watch out for these shoe mines that are around the place. But uh, okay, the Dushka now forced to reposition means that these Volks Grenadiers can now start pushing if they want. No, it's too late because. Whoa, Dushkas do good damage at that range, at any range it seems. Even on a retreating squad of Panzer Fusiliers, they got two models at mid and long range, not bad. Um, and it's going to be a T-34 here. Going to be keeping on the, the momentum-based pressuring style of this uh, Soviet assault here. And perhaps, you could argue, that is a style to which Soviet defensive doctrine is well suited. Going to finally lose the scout car here, discovering that the Schwer Panzer HQ is there. That that is, has to be one of the most long-lived M5 scout cars. Or is, it, or is it an M1? Can you call that thing again? Or is it an M1? It's a M3A1. God oh, damn it. Uh, oh no! Oh, he lost his conscripts. Ooh, and that's a bad mess. Okay, well, you you really do need to uh, you really do need to rebuy them. You cannot play the game without them. Losing the conscripts and then losing the M5 in a short period of time is a bit of a power swing there. And the OKW player now pushing up to try and make a uh, make good on these advantages. Oh yeah, so the Soviet scout car also provides massive line of sight. Interesting point, Dan. I, I usually only think of the T-70 as being the Soviet's line of sight providing unit, because it's really only the T-70 that we ever see consistently get to VET-3 and then survive into the late game. But uh, of course the M3A1 does have great line of sight when it starts vetting up. Yeah, he did get a T-34. Yeah, he did. So here it comes. And the T-34 kind of looks okay, I guess, but it's going to get dominated by the Panzer IV, as will everything else on this roster. And this is kind of what I was a bit worried about. We still don't have support weapon Campania. There is no option for ZIS guns here. M42 AT guns are like, ooh, they're okay, but this is an OKW Panzer IV. You know, the M42 isn't going to scare it too much. So I am a bit worried here that we're going to die because, like, we sometimes see Vermac players die if they try to skip like the mechanized company, and then they just get ground under under too much too much armor. I do worry a bit here. Ooh, Katusha on the queue. I do worry a bit here that the uh, the lack of Zis gun is going to be make this Panzer IV a very difficult beast to track down. No conscripts as well, so no AT grenades either. Um, I suppose we could put more PTRSs on these guards, but. And then they would have the anti-vehicle satchel grenade. Actually, you know what? And he's got a lot of munition stacking here, and we are about to have anti-tank overwatch, which is ridiculous. It like it is one of the most potentially amazingly powerful abilities in the game. It's it's really cool. I like it. Um, so you know, maybe then maybe the AT pieces are here. If we can get the PTRSs, we do have the munitions for that. If we can get an anti-vehicle satchel grenade in, the pieces are here. Anti-vehicle satchel grenade followed by anti-vehicle overwatch is going to be pretty powerful, to be honest. That will probably do it. But we do need to buy those PTRSs first. So here comes the Panzer IV. After it reveals itself, we'd like to see Kanji here make, make the adaptation to get the second set of uh, PTRSs. Dushka is, means beloved in Russian. Interesting. Wow. That's, a, that's an interesting fact. All right, the Katusha Barrage heading out now. Actually rolling a miss, it seems. Yeah, finding no damage with that Barrage. That's unlucky. But this is, I mean, it's, it is unlucky in a way, but also that was a speculative, a speculative... Man, that word always tricks me up, trips me up. That was a very speculative Barrage, and 
I always think that's kind of the worst way to use rocket artillery, really. It almost never pays off. It's just so desperate and flaily. It's like, wait until you know that you're going to find some value. Even if, the, even if it's not direct damage, even if it's just breaking some squads or getting rid of a troublesome weapon team that, you know, forcing it to pack up and move. Are these speculative barrages where you just fire it into fog of war in a place where you kind of suspect your opponent has units? Like, even if the units are there, the rockets seldom ever fall correctly to hit them. It's much better to fire at something that you're going to force to move, in my opinion. Oh, A game. Apparently it doesn't mean that. I mean, A game would know kind of our channel authority on the on the on that particular language another t-34 all right t-34 is going to come on in here panzer 4 going to rotate to meet it fires the first shot into these penals and the this gun is here on support so i believe the panzer 4 actually cannot stay and fight here and is that the that's the tank commander barrage uh-oh the this gun actually sorry it's an m42 of course not a this gun uh yeah, this is what I mean. The Panzer IV, especially the OKW Panzer IV, at least in the frontal armor, does not have to fear. Oh no, we wasted the anti-tank overwatch. Oh no. Oh, Kanji, that looks so bad. Okay, well, that was all of the worst things that I was afraid about for this Soviet army happening at once. The T-34 getting utterly outclassed by the Panzer IV. The M42 AT gun not able to threaten that Panzer IV. And then the anti-tank overwatch... You cannot just use it on a Panzer IV. Your opponent has to be asleep for that to work. You have to get an anti-tank grenade or an anti-tank satchel grenade or get your T-34 behind the Panzer IV so it can't reverse. You have to do something. You can't just waste 200 munitions and that is what happened. And now, okay, actually we do have enough munitions banked where we can do it again, so okay. But it's just a bit concerning, like... You know, you need to have some setup. Anti-tank Overwatch is terrifically powerful, but if you, it's, it's only powerful if you have the setup. It's not even that hard to get set up for, but it's like you do need to do a little bit of preparation for it. Um, ram into Overwatch is another other yeah, that people are mentioning in chat. I'm never super big of a fan of a ram into Overwatch, but I mean, if needs be, then it, it will get the job done. Um, and... Uh, it's also, I mean, this is against a Panzer IV. Against a Tiger tank, sometimes it is okay just to have a long range of line of sight because Tiger tanks are so slow, you can just call down the ability and then as long as you can keep them revealed, the anti-tank overwatch will stack in a lot of damage. And um, it even breaks engines, actually, after a while. Like, I think, well, I've seen it break engines, like, so many times. I don't know if that's still the case. Um, so, like... Yeah, once 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 you get the engine breaking shell down, then 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 the Panzer's fate is usually sealed. I think that they might have taken away the engine breaking and the gun breaking because it was like so too good. It was like ridiculously OP. Um, because even if you got splashed like once or twice by the anti-tank Overwatch, it would like break all the bits on your tank, and it was just like, hmm, well, this seems a bit good. Okay, Panzer IV continuing to vet up. Double T-34, impotent in the face of this Axis composition. Well, I don't want to say impotent, but has not yet found a window to really find much value. Let's put it that way. Gets tagged by a stray Faust up in north. That'll be this T-34 off the line for a little while. These are Soviet mines. In this position just here. No metal detector, actually, for the Axis player. A little concerning. <laughs> You're thinking Panther, James. Uh, uh, I mean, he can save for Tiger, you see. He's very close. So there's that option as well. Um, I mean, the, the Panther is absolutely fine, but I'm wondering if it isn't just a bit overkill here. The thing about the Panther, though, is it is nice and fast. Nexus is a slightly bigger map, but the Tiger 1 is not too slow. Tigers are for schoolgirls. <laughs> the pa the pan the P4J is a strong opponent against the T34s. Yeah, see, at the back of my mind, I was like, why not just go up to another t another Panzer IV because it's so good against all this infantry. But it seems clear that he is saving for a Tiger tank. To me, that's what this implies. Because you could have bought the Panther a, a minute or so ago, perhaps, and 
the tiger is the big shiny button, right? And players love big shiny buttons. Okay, Katusha here gonna cast in a barrage. Gets the ram. Okay, now we go for the anti-tank overwatch. One hit. Now that broke the engine, so clearly it does still break engines, which is stupid. Now we need line of sight. Switch to the Soviet player. Oh, I see he's lost line of sight. Oh, he was so close. You just can't see that Panzer IV. And the German player doing everything to control that line of sight. Gets another anti-tank overwatch shell in there. But it won't be enough. And now the Tiger Tank is here. Actually awkwardly catching a, an anti-tank overwatch shell for its trouble there. Tiger Tank versus T-70. Well, sometimes size does matter. And, I mean, that time was a lot better. But it's still... The, the execution still wasn't there for uh, Soviet... For Kanji here. So, SU-85. This I actually like. One of the T-34s was lost there. Um, oh, here it is. Uh, got 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 taken out there. Um, that is actually abandoned. A touch awkward. And the Tiger Tank will even pick up this AT gun. Now, the SU-85 is necessary because we are gasping for AT resources here for the Soviet player. And with the advent of this Tiger Tank, which already nearly has a star of veterancy, with the advent of this Tiger Tank hitting the battlefield, obviously that changes a lot of things. He's going to nick the T-34. Noise. Okay. All right, buddy. You probably want to start creeping that out of there. I pre oh, is the engine actually destroyed? Oh, it is immobilized. Ah, right. Gonna need to get some storm pioneers over here then. Um, so this this unlikely to see to see actual use, but might might be able to get repaired. Uh, but now that the tiger tank is here, yeah, we do need the SU-85. But Nexus is a great map for an SU-85. It's so big in the middle. There's so much room to 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 kite. Um, that I, th I feel like this SU-85 is poised for greatness here, if it is correctly microed. Katusha here, going to take a barrage. Uh, so just another speculative one. You had no information about what's going on out here. You're just using it because it was on cooldown, or off cooldown. I don't like these barrages. It's just kind of a waste. This Katusha... You just, you just, just wait till we have a target, man. It's so much more effic efficient if you just wait. It's okay to let it sit there. Just just keep it in your pocket till you need it. Can't be fun sitting in a burning tank. I was just thinking that, Emma Dranky. Oh, no! Oh, no! The tiger tank... Oh, God! Crucial, crucial error on the SU-85. And that should be a dead tank hunter. That sh really should be a dead tank hunter. Where's the T-34? Okay. Anti-tank overwatch comes down now. Hang on. In a really bad position. Why is it over here? The Tiger Tank isn't there anymore. All right, here comes the T-34, though. And now the SU-85 can capitalize because it has something to hide behind. All right, push forwards. He's not pushing. Oh, my God. There we go. Gets it. Okay. Somehow pulling out a kill on the Tiger Tank out of thin air there. I feel like Kanji got very lucky there, but even still, losing a Dushka. So that's pretty horrendous, and we're running out of infantry squads here. To be honest, we could call in some more stuff. We've got 700 manpower. Wow, I feel like I feel like the Soviet player um, kind of got super lucky there, right? Because the SU-85 was in a terrible place, right? And it, here, this this exact piece right here where the SU-85 was is really bad. The reason is, you cannot reverse over this, yeah? Any time that the, the back of your SU-85 is blocked by something impassable, you're gonna have a bad time, I promise you. Um, so, hang on a second, does the Axis player actually have this, uh, this T-34? Awesome. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So, that was the beginning of the sort of bad, bad, the bad decision-making on that engagement. Um, then the anti-tank overwatch kind of came down here. He just clicked on the tiger rather than where the tiger was heading. If the anti-tank overwatch was here, you get a lot more value out of it. Um, and then he got lucky that the tiger missed a shot or two on the SU-85. That could easily have been a hit that broke the gun, and then the tiger just rips through you. So, you know, the Soviet player getting a bit lucky on the way out of that fight there, to be honest. What happened to the Panzer IV? I have no idea. I, I, saw, I felt it explode when the, map, when the map shook, but I have not yet found its wreck. Uh, possibly it hit a mine or got, got killed by the anti-tank overwatch. I'm not actually sure. Sorry for missing that. Um, cannot tell you, I'm afraid. And, uh, alright, now the Katusha is firing. Finds... 
kind of nothing again. That's awkward. <laughs> um, got a couple of hits on some weapon teams, but nothing game-changing, I'm afraid. This T-34, though... Sorry, this T-70 has been value. Look at this little guy go. Donk! The light gun getting some fat veterancy from hitting the top of that one. That is an Axis T-34, Daton. Welcome to the game. Welcome to the beautiful display, the special snowflake we have unfolding before us. Yes, a Soviet T- uh, Sorry, an Axis T-34. He actually did get that one out of there. Uh, okay, so, alright, when the dust settles, alright, it's Katusha T-34, T-70, SU-85. That is a marvellous armoured lineup. There's There's a brilliant selection of vehicles for any Soviet player. There's a lot to work with. You can do tons with that. Double Dushka, double engineer, double penals. Eh, needs more help. This is a game that's going to be about controlling the victory points. As the scoreline now, the Axis player is caught up. So, the double dishka will help you there, but you need some more pushing infantry. At this point, just go up to, like, quad engineer. I'm not even fussed about getting conscripts. Just go up to quad engineer. They'll be fine. They're cheaper. They can repair your tanks as well. Um, they're just really cool. So, I, I think just go up to quad engineer here. Uh, for the Axis player, we've got a fantastic infantry roster. Look at the veterancy and equipment on these Volks and these Storm and these uh, Panzer Fusiliers and the Storm uh, Pioneers. You know, all looking great. We've got uh, an MG34 that has been doing awesome and a Dushka that we've just nicked. So, and double Kettenwerfer Lig. That is a sick infantry roster. Not so much to work with on the tank side of things, just a measly T34. So, this battle can definitely go either way and it's going to come down to how these next engagements look and what the Axis player decides to spend their fuel on in the next few minutes. That's what's going to shape this game. Finally, the Katusha takes a good barrage based on good intel and will wipe out a, a unit of Volks Grenadiers. That's nice, because the Axis player wants to be saving their manpower right now, so that is a great thing to have taken out. The light gun here, finally, perhaps, going to get punished for its positioning here, maybe? No. T-34 has other things that it needs to do. SU-85 going to creep forwards, displaying some interest, perhaps, in trying to siege down the Schwer Panzer HQ, and that does make sense. T-34 here picks up one of the Kettenwerfers, has to sneak out past the arc of the other now, but should be able to do so. Yep, probably going to be able to get out of there just fine. Yagdi? That is a sick choice, actually. The Yagdi fits the right profile for a number of reasons, right? It's very good against all these armored targets. The Yagdi can actually deal with an SU-85 because the Yagdi has the um, ambush camo. So if you get the first shot, you are usually going to win the duel. And especially with the extra damage you get on the um, coming out of camo shot. So I actually, the Yagdi is actually quite good at countering specifically the SU-85. It also will help you a lot with all these other armoured targets that you're struggling with here for the Axis player. Um, it also is relatively cheap on manpower and kind of cheapish on fuel. So the Yagdi here fits the, um, fits the profile for the unit that we need here in a number of ways. It's very clever. The one problem, the one fear, of course, is that the T-34s are able to get up on top of its sides and rear. And... With two Raketenwerfers and a Schwer Panzer HQ to work with, that shouldn't be happening as long as you don't fall asleep microing this Yagdi. So I do like the Yagdi here. It looks good. It does look good. Is that an Axis T-34? Boiter. Boiter te virant Dreisig. Um. Oh. Okay, see, there's nothing there. These Katusha barrages are just so bad. Third T-34. Okay, I actually don't hate that. Smoke pot's coming down in south here. <laughs> this Axis T-34 is still just cracking me up. So good. Yeah, it is cool, actually, Dan. You're right. In Steel Division, there are some um, divisions you can take that do have, like, captured tanks. Um, like... There is that one that has the Firefly, and there's um, there's a couple of others in the game as well, aren't there, I think. And it's really cool. It's just exciting. Okay, he doesn't actually have the unit cap for this T-34, actually. But, I mean, dude, if we can if we can partner up this, this SU-85 with the with the sight range on the, on the T-70, we're going to be looking so clever here in this game. Oh, the T-34 is going to commit into south here. And Soviet players are so weird with the way they move their T-34s. I swear I just have like a sort of huge, massive, big brain understanding of how they should use them. And no one ever does. I'm always just like, wah, raging about how they mismanage them. <laughs> um, all right. This T-34 will be forfeit, actually. That, that Kettenwerfer just picking that one up, more or less for free. And now look, the Yagdi striking from the correct angle. Oh no, the SU-85 going to reveal itself. 
The Yagni not pushing. There we go. Now it pushes. How is it not firing? Oh god, he has no scouting. There we go. He finally finds it. And getting the first shot is everything. And now he's he's left the T-34 behind the SU-85. No! Okay, now back up the SU-85. You're not going to win that. Oh, good god. Goes for the ram. Anti-tank overwatch is ready. Yeah, anti-tank overwatch ought to... What? He's not going to use it? That's a bit late. It, it comes down, but late. You've got no vision now. <laughs> no! Where's the T-70? Oh, no. The T-70 is late to the party. It was repairing. All right. Now it, now it reveals. Now it reveals. Now he knows where that is. All right. Now the anti-tank overwatch will do its work. Right? Oh, no. He creeps out of the area. No, he's still in the area. But the T-70 just can't see it. Oh, he had to switch to gun mode. Why did we switch off observation mode? He switched off observation mode and the Yagdi will survive. That seems like a strange decision to me. Katusha here taking a sweet shot into a big old cluster of Axis units, but actually somehow clicking the one spot where the Axis units were not. Okay, and the Katusha there gets picked off by this Kettenwerfer. You would love to show up to a party in a T-70. Yeah, me too, man. I would love to show up to a party in a Kubel wagon. That would be my thing. In fact, you know what? I would love to show up to a party by a lake in a Schwimmwagen. Yeah. Let that one sink in. How many layers of awesome is that? Just everybody's like partying by the lake. There's like a barbecue going. And then I just like roll over the lake in my Schwimmwagen. Uh, I believe that is a concession out of the Soviet player. Wow, that is actually not clear who left the game or if it was just a crash, but I think it's fair to say that the Axis player has that one in the bag. Um, wow, the old Axis T-34 surviving to the end of the game and getting a Star of Veterancy is some pretty cool some pretty cool stuff there. Um, nicely done, nicely played. Uh, I think Soviets gave up. Yeah, I think so, Daten, yeah. Um, but I mean, look, I've cast this Kanji player many times, many times, and they are a very good player. But over the course of this game and the last one that I cast, they actually made some pretty, some pretty just, just obvious execution errors. Like, I don't agree, I don't disagree with a lot of the decision making, but the execution, for example, the Katusha barrages, like, at least half of them were just terrible. Like, just the kind of barrages that you really should not be taking. The only time I, I really like a zero intel speculative barrage is when you've just forced a load of Axis infantry to fall back and you can put the barrage down, like, on their base. And even that, that is not really speculative, is it? Because you, you know that they're going to be there, so, like... That's when it's good. Um, the the anti-tank overwatch, there was a couple of questionable decisions regarding placement, timing, and then follow-up. Like, we could definitely have gotten that Yag, that Yag Panzer if we hadn't, like, put down the anti-tank overwatch late or if we hadn't turned off recon mode on the T-70 at, like, just the crucial moment when we needed it. Um, so, yeah, I feel like that was a mistake. Um, I kind of feel like even if you open special rifle command the support weapon campanile doesn't cost that much and i know it feels bad especially because we're rolling with defensive community doctrine guy but sometimes you just need this guns mate the m42 will not do sometimes you just need this guns in fact i would say often you just need this guns so given that the support weapon campanile is not that expensive i think Resist guns would have been useful in this game. Um, but beyond that, I mean, the M5 Scout car survived for ages. The penals survived all game and looked pretty cool. Um, there's a lot to like about the playstyle here. It's just um, a little bit more polish, a little bit more execution. And I feel like this Soviet Kanji will be a really good player because there's a lot of promise here. Um, for TIE Flyger, um, yeah, I mean, just a, a solid display of OKW ability. Um, I almost feel like TIE Flyger was just the safe bet in this race. Um, at some point, our Soviet player here was just going to make too big of a mistake or throw something weird out there. You know, like, 
I just feel like as long as Tie Flyger played in a sane way, they were always going to win this game because this Soviet kanji is just trying some weird stuff and some of it's hitting and some of it isn't. And yeah, I feel like I feel like just a calm OKW style, which is what we saw, would have been enough. Nice to grab the T-34, that's always fun. Um, and the Tiger Tank was probably a bit excessive. I think we all agreed that there were other choices that would have been better. Another Panzer IV, uh, even a Panther Tank. Um, a couple of suggestions there that I think would have been better than a Tiger under those circumstances. But like I said before, you know, the big shiny button is incredibly tempting. And when you pick a Tiger Commander, it's usually because you want to play with a Tiger. And uh, it's, it's hard to say no to that. Um, so uh, let me see, what, what, what does chat think of all this? You always need Zisk guns uh, because you can't depend on penals of guards or even M42s. Yeah, I agree. Um, couldn't reply earlier, but I went to look at the wiki page and it says, Dear Beloved Person, which is somehow different in my mind than Only Beloved. And it actually makes sense. Oh, okay, cool. There we go. All right. Thanks, A-game. Getting the, getting the language double checker on for us there. Okay. Cool. All right. So that has been a good clutch of Company of Heroes 2 games there. I have had a ton of fun casting those. Um, we got to see some sweet UKF style there from um, Caesar. And uh, we got to see PGA. And um, we got some interesting styles and strats. And we got to see some lesser spotted units on the channel today, including an Axis T-34. So that's some pretty exciting stuff for sure. Uh, another look at the schedule, of course, just for those of you who don't know. -da -da -da. We're going to be casting on Wednesday and Friday this week in the evening, 1700 hours GMT. If you felt like joining me, then that would be awesome. And now, Datton, indeed, you have detected it accurately and correctly. It is time to bring the desert heat. Um, you know what? It actually occurs to me, for some strange reason, probably because I've not really cast very much Deserts of Karak since I've been using OBS, I actually, I actually don't have a Deserts of Karak um, OBS like scene. So uh, now might be a good idea to just to quickly set one up. Actually. Um, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna rock on into some Deserts of Karak action here for our final game of the day. Uh, I've already loaded up a replay, so I'm looking forward to seeing exactly who's going to be in that replay. Now, just bear with me. Uh, I'm going to going to make a Deserts of Karak scene here. Oops. Uh, okay, well, the easiest way of doing this has got to be to... Can we just duplicate this one, please? How do we duplicate this thing? Oh, man, there's definitely a way of duplicating these things. Can I just copy it? No. Ah, there it is. Duplicate. Okay, there we go. Okay, sorry about this, guys. I'm, uh, I'm not using studio mode because I'm so good at this. All right, there we go. Sweet. Okay, all right. Without further ado, then, let's get into it. Emma Duranke, man. Thank you very much. James as well. Um, sorry, you guys got to get back to work or whatever it is that's taking you away, but uh, I'm really glad you tuned in. Thank you very much for spending your time with me. It was great to have you boys in chat. Okay, so it looks like we've got another game here between Bozo Cow and A Game Anx. So let's uh, let's go ahead and load on into that. God, I'm carrying around so much hair these days. Look at all this. Look at all this nonsense. It's like so absurdly huge. What's up with that? <laughs> okay. All right, the game is loaded. So let's bring everyone into the game. Oops. Ooh, Deserts of Karak is a game, not a game that particularly likes it when I alt tab around the place. All right, so if I select a unit, all right, I'll tell you what, let's just quickly pause the game. If I alt tab, oh, it goes away. Okay, I'm going to have to design an overlay for this when I'm done then. Because when I alt tab it disappears and that's super annoying. Okay, well, this is going to annoy me the most. So let's put that over there. All right, for now we're just going to have to deal with the fact that the overlay just doesn't make any sense. But uh, it's okay because the game is watchable. Uh, okay, so spawning in the south here playing as the uh, blue Galzian forces. It is going to be... Bozo Cow. And spawning in the north. Playing as the black coalition forces it is a game anx 
So uh, the series score so far, um, if we're calling it a series, I know these are just random replays that A-Game assembled into a package for me, but the series score so far, 1-0 to zero in favor of A-Game Axe, uh, taking the first game um, in our last stream on Friday on Kalash Teeth. But what a close game it was. Bozo Cow has developed so much as a player. Um, it's like just what a great journey. Anti Morale coming out the woodwork for a bit of DOK. Um, uh, yeah, uh, just a just a really cool, um, really cool story to watch Bozo Cow like reach such heights um, from from such like I don't know from such mortal beginnings. Um, so anyway, here comes the probe, of course, and that is is he gonna see that? I actually think that those guys might have just skimmed around the edge of vision there. So I actually think A-Game does not quite realize that it's a sand skimmer poke coming out across the map. Let me just check the tech here. Uh, so it's going to be a railgun push off of this production carrier. Okay. All right. So the probe is going to back across the map here. A-Game's seen enough from what's going on in the home field here for Bozo Cow. And he's going to start looking around for what's going on. But I think... These sand skimmers coming out of Fog of War might be the first A game knows that this po that this poke is coming, uh, and Bozo actually electing to reveal the sand skimmers even. Hmm. I feel like you actually didn't have to do that. Railgun fabrication going to finish up here in about seven seconds, and then we're going to be building railguns on the doorstep of A game's base here, and that's going to be tough times. AAV fabrication is actually not done. Wow. Oh. Did he go... Oh yeah, so this was like a, a sort of a macro-oriented opening with the support cruiser. I mean, that is normal for A-game, and it usually works fine, but Bozo is actually going to be bringing some heat here. If Bozo starts building heavy railguns, this starts looking really bad, but Bozo's not building heavy railguns. There's a window of time here where if Bozo built heavy railguns, I think this game kind of almost ends. Like, it doesn't end end-to-end, but it looks super bad for A-game. If you start pressuring A-game here with heavy railguns, isn't that really nasty? Um, oh, don't worry, A-game. Well, I'm just taking them essentially almost at random, or maybe even just from the top of the folder from the regame from the replay package you put together, so don't don't worry too much about which games are in there and or in which order. It's cool. Um, dude, oh my god though, did Bozo miss an opportunity here? Why, oh my god, look, delaying heavy railguns so far. There could have been a lot of work done with heavy railguns here if we just make one or two before this production cruiser. I know production cruisers are great, but um, th that was a real missed opportunity. It really was. Okay, now the first one comes out, but this is like a minute later maybe. This is the really meta one production cruiser heavy railgun push and Bozo Cow's most favorite style. Okay. Sure, I dig it. But now look, now now the LAVs are here to like try and push this back. I like the high ground advantage, but the carrier means that you cannot maintain that. And there's just not enough railguns here to to significantly threaten what A game is doing. And now A game actually has railguns coming out, and that, that is the end of the push. So uh, yeah, Daten, uh, sorry, Bozo Cow here, gonna have to respect um, respect that this is over. Gonna have to respect that. Gonna have to. Oh no, I, I don't know about skirmishing here. I don't like about skirmishing here. Oh, what's uh, what's the issue, Dan? All right. Why do units not snap to dune tops when formation dragging? Um, I guess that functionality is just not in the game. Yes, the entire gameplay is built around dune top control, and I will admit it's very annoying to micro that, that's for sure. But hey, it's skill dependent. Insert discussion about how games being skill dependent does not necessarily equal better game. All right, so, okay, Bozo here putting up a pretty good job of uh, holding off these this LAV ball while the uh, the railgun on the um, on the high ground over here finding some nice shots that's useful to do applying pressure meanwhile of course bozo will be expanding relatively unimpeded oh i say that no actually bozo has routed his second production cruiser to the front so it is actually a game who has the economic advantage here who is mining off of two locations more fluently than uh, than bozo who is long distancing um, so okay the sand skim is going to come in for a dive here the railgun actually just not really supporting risky dive there I 
didn't actually see if he destroyed very many uh, um, salvages or not. Uh, but he is messing with the mining, and that is annoying. Uh oh, okay, two two v one here. These railguns for a game uh, will. Uh, okay, oh sorry, I didn't spot the second railgun. Did this just pop out? All right, well. Uh, now it comes down to who has the better target firing with the railguns, as these two rail as these railguns sniping at each other across the top of this dune line. The sand skimmers are just actually cleaning house. Look at this high ground position advantage here for uh, for Bozo doing so much work, and Bozo taking care it seems not to overextend. Um, so this is a very interesting position and has actually worked down this carrier. You know what you could try and do here, actually, as Bozo Cow? You could just transition to the left side of this sand dune and set up the railguns here and just, like, ping this carrier down relentlessly. Uh, I suppose that exposes you to the railguns of A-game, but he actually only has one, and you do know that. So if you have the cognitive capacity to work out everything I just did, then you can push in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, he's he's kind of doing it. Yeah, he's pushing in. Puts the um puts the railguns to the left side of the uh, sand dune. That's what we like. And continues pinging down the carrier. I like this. Okay, Ooh, we can't back off too far though, bro. Let's not give him too much room. We need to still keep eyes on this carrier. That's the most important thing. And the LAVs are going to make that difficult. I appreciate. But th and this high ground advantage is just masterful as well. Look at look at this position. God damn, this is actually a really hard thing about this map. Um. A game. I, I can see you're trying to hold ground the turret, and I agree that you are most likely dead. Um, <coughs> uh, but yeah, the game is not over yet. Your carrier still has some more hits to give, and there's plenty more room you can kite back into if you really want to hide it. So, definitely not over, but these sand skimmers are taking names. Let's check the upgrades. Armor is done on these sand skimmers versus A game, who also has armor. So, even on terms of upgrades, these railguns are the real story, though. If they just keep focusing the carrier. Oh, dropping some shots there is uh, Bozo. But I appreciate that he's doing a lot, so it's easy to do. But yeah, so A game has realised the further every meter this carrier goes back, the more stable A game's position becomes, and the position is now largely stable. It feels like Sandskim is going to come in, getting a bit greedy. Really wants to get the base runner before it can put down any more super annoying turrets, and that is nice. It does pick it off, and. Uh, the railguns actually are probably better off focusing down logistics modules and things, because um, that's super annoying. That's a thing that I often see um, Galsian players overlook is um, just p just picking off these logistic modules. It is annoying. You do force the uh, you do force the rebuy on them. So let's just check the backfield. Still long distance mining, but that's acceptable. That is actually more than A game is getting now. A game finally building up a couple of railguns here. These railguns on the high ground for uh, Bozo Cow have just been so good. Houston13906, how's it going, friend? Better late than never. Joining us here for a game of Deserts of Karak, that is seeing the Galzian player anchoring a ridiculously powerful, aggressive stance against uh, this Coalition player who is on the ropes right now, but definitely not defeated. Hey, A-game, what do you think happens if Bozo just comes in... For Whoa, the railguns, no, they go for... Oh, the oh, a little bit of a missed micro there. Execution fail from Bozo Cow. Bozo is very good with LAV and rails. Um, I'm seeing it, man. Yeah, up to three rails is nice. And as the LAVs come in, the railguns are safe for now. We just need to spam produce more sand skimmers out of these PCs. And then I think we've won the game. Yeah. Okay, I think Bozo's going to take this one. Bozo can just push in and, yeah, A-game knows it. That's going to be the concession. Nice. Early game aggression and pressure put on by forward produ production carrier, sand skimmers into railguns. I actually think there were a couple of moments there where Bozo could have executed better, um, but still getting the job done against one of the scariest players in the game. So that is a great win to take there. Bozo Cow getting off to a magnificent, a magnificent win in that one. That's really good to see. Uh, and that is kind of one of the cool things about Homeworld Deserts of Karak. It is an RTS that has proper and correct pacing. You do not have to commit an hour of your life every time you decide you want to watch or play a game. And uh, that is a criticism about Company of Heroes 2, which I will be very vocal about, because it is mispaced. You cannot demand that long. It's really annoying. All the best RTSs from throughout history have an ideal game length of 10, 10, to 10 minutes to 30 minutes, and Company of Heroes 2 exceeds that regularly. Anyway, that's a rant for another time. Sorry to throw that in there. But what I'm saying is... Look how quickly we got through a whole game of Deserts of Karak. It's so cool. Um, 
What a great game it was as well. Bozo Cow looking absolutely awesome. Am I ever interested to play Deserts of Karak on stream? Yes. And I have done in the past, actually. Years ago now, but I have. Uh, but I have... Um, I've been having a lot of problems playing RTSs recently because I have RSI in my hands. Um, in fact, it's not just even in my hands. It's like just a thing that has happened to my tendons. Apparently, I think it might be hereditary because my mum has like a real problem with it. But anyway, that's a discussion for another time as well. Yes, I'd love to play some Deserts of Karak. I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, I don't want to overdo it right now because I've been doing these exercises and things and building up some strength. And now I finally feel like my tendons are kind of okay. So I'm just easing myself into a bit of RTS, playing drums and doing things like that again. And just like, we'll see how it goes, basically. But yeah, I'm really keen to play some Deserts of Karak. It'd be really cool. Um, oh, thanks, buddy. Yeah, man, I could really use a practice partner. No kidding, I could really use a practice partner. That would be really useful. Um, cool, okay. All right, well, that is going to conclude today's stream. Uh, a fantastic clutch of Company of Heroes 2 games there and some really interesting deserts of Karak action. So I'm going to head on into um, Twitch here and just check out who is streaming in Company of Heroes 2 and uh, just see if we can uh, see if we can host someone up here. See if I can pass you guys on to the good hands of someone. Uh, you know what, actually? Hold up. You know what you know what you might find interesting? I was watching someone play um, Command & Conquer Remastered just now. They were, like, number three on the ladder. And uh, they were, they were, it was great to watch them. It was, like, DK Command & Conquer was their name. Um, yeah, here he is. All right, we're going to host this guy because he's real cool. You'll enjoy this guy. If you want, if you just like watching somebody play some really sick Command & Conquer remastered ladder action, this guy knows what's up. This guy is really good. Who's this? Robbie Gate. Thank you very much for the follow, friend. It means a lot. Glad you enjoy the stream. I'm passing on over to uh, to somebody else right now. But uh, thank you very much for your support, and we'll see you in the future. Here we go, friends. We're gonna go. We're gonna go watch some Command & Conquer remastered because it's freaking hilarious and this guy is actually a pretty sweet streamer as well so do be nice thank you very much everybody have fun